Il Filostrato Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by Hubertus Cummings, Assistant Professor of English Literature in the University of Cincinnati, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. August 1922, Canto 1. Some poets, lady, still of Jove do crave. Fair favor for poetic enterprise. Others invoke Apollo's aid to save. Their fragile verse. Even I, with frequent sighs, besought Parnassian muses, all too grave. My theme to lift through music to the skies. But love, who changed old use, doth now require. I seek thine aid alone, my true song to inspire. Thou, lady, art that clear and lovely light, which in the darkness still my life illumes. And thou that only star serenely bright, whose ray across the mountains sweet assumes the guidance of my bark from storm and night, till anchored there where joyous comfort blooms. With thee who art my Phoebus, art my Jove, my muse, and all the good I feel and know of love. Lady, thy absence now, to me a woe. Greater than death itself constrains my will to write the grievous life of Troilo. When after Chryseis, who caused his ill, was forced, yet all in love with him, to go. Outside the Trojan walls, ere either fill, of amorous delights had known. So wise, thy puissant aid I seek for this my enterprise. Whence, lady fair, whose faithful servitor, I ever have been, who subject ever hence, shall be, and thy fair eyes refulgent store, of light, where love my every joy of sense, hath placed my only hope, I thee implore, as one who loves thee than himself much more, with perfect love, guide thou my hand aright, direct my mind in what my soul hath come to write, in my sad heart thou art so effigied, thou hast become more potent there than I, O oh, bring my voice then from my heart, I plead, so sad it shall through sorrow's tones descry, my own deep grief and Troil's woes and start, Whoever hears to pity of my need, and if men listen, be the honor thine, the praise thy words shall win, the labor be but mine. And ye, O lovers, now I pray attend, the tale my tear-brimmed cantos would rehearse, and if perchance in your hearts doth extend, a spirit rising piteous to my verse, I pray you pray that am more succor lend, to me like Troil neath a heavy curse, of grief, in that I live afar from her who would in every mind sweet joy and pleasance stir. The kings of Greece besieged in full array, the ample walls of Troy, and all in pride, of armor blazoned rich abode the fray, ardent and eager proud, as each descried. The power Greece acquired from day to day, they showed themselves in one great wish allied, to avenge the insult and the bold rapine, by Paris done, of Helen, Menelaus's queen. When Calchas, that famed seer whose science high, had merited full oft Apollo's trust, and won him sager knowledge from the sky, with will to learn inquired which party must, expect to win at last if victory, to Trojan suffering long or Grecian's lust, in battle, mead should be, and waiting, heard, the war assured Troy's doom, a bitter, cruel word, and, knowing now her hosts would all be slain, and Troy are long destroyed the cunning seer, resolved on sudden flight and, counsel taken, duly of time and place rode slyly near, the Grecian lines, and there upon the plain, full many Greeks on seeing him appear, arose to welcome him with faces bright, hoping his wit might help, should theirs come evil plight. Great was the uproar in the Trojan town, when rumor on her eager wings had sped, the news abroad, our wary prophets frown, no more can warn us now, for he is fled. A traitor proved, and to the Greeks gone down, then, by his crime inflamed and fury led. The crowd was scarce restrained from vengeance dire, and feeling flared up quick to set his house on fire. Calchas, in that ill hour's evil case, all uninformed of his intended flight, had left behind in that quick hostile place an only widowed daughter, fair as light. No mortal thing but one of angels' grace. She seemed, and Chrysaeus named, to human sight. 
the loveliest of all Troy's womanhood, dainty and lissom, wise, most chastely true and good, who, learning soon all dolorous the cause, of that rude outcry Calchas's treachery, for all that furious hubbub made no pause, but Rose donned mourning habit tearfully, like one who toward an altar suppliant draws, and, seeking Hector, fell to bended knee, bemoaning Calchas' guilt with piteous face, the while she guiltless begged the prince might lend her grace, great Hector was by nature pitiful, and hearing there that lady's weeping plaint. Fairer than ladies fair by every rule, she was, with measured speech and sweet restraint. Bade Chrysae's comfort take, thy father, fool, in evil erring, be dismissed and faint. Amid the Greeks, quoth he, but in security, dwell thou, fair lady, here as long as pleaseth thee. Such favors as thou wilt and honors too, as if sage Calcha still were here, receive. For certain now, we grant them as thy due, in every future need. Cease hence to grieve, but him may God with condign shame pursue, and more to press her thanks, ere taking leave. He suffered Chrysaes not, whereat she rose, and sought her mansion out and there more safe repose. Such household there as fitted her estate, and to her honor, Chrysaes maintained the while she dwelt in Troy without debate, modest in custom and in life unstained, marvel of chasteness in her widow's state. Sans any child to be in havior trained, she was as free as maid still unpossessed, by all who knew her loved and by all richly blessed. So things progressed as in war usually, twixt Greeks and Trojans ever much the same. Oft times the Trojans came out valiantly, and, driving back the Greeks, earned praise and fame. Oft times the Greeks, unless much history, doth e'er went at their foes with lusty game, up to their very moat, and even inside. They robbed, burned hall and villa, plundered far and wide, and still the Trojans, hard as they were pressed, by the high daring of their Grecian foes, failed never once their reverence to attest, in holy rites, but evermore they chose, to keep their customs, and, as suppliants dressed, Crowded good palace's temple, where arose many a solemn anthem in high praise, many a Trojan's vow, his prayer, his reverent gaze. For now fair spring had come, whose potent sway reclose the meads with flowers and grasses new, when every beast becomes both blithe and gay, and brings by divers acts his loves to view, when Trojan sires had bid such honors pay to the divine palladium as were due. Ladies and knights joined that festivity, in equal manner coming all most willingly. Mongst others, Calchas's daughter Chrysaes moved, apparelled chastely in her russet weeds. Wherein, just as the rose hath ever proved, still fairer than the violet, which leads, in beauty other flowers, that lady loved, surpassed the fairest in her modest deeds, and, by her presence near the temple door, made goodlier yet that great feat's rich and goodly store. When mid the throng, as youths are wont to do, peering about the temple here and there, Prince Troilo approached with other few, and stopped and stood Troy's ladies to compare. This one, he gan, was fair, that one a shrew, so praised or blamed, like one who did not care, like one to whom no maid could give delight, or youth who'd keep him free in every maid's despite. In such a mood of scorn proceeding free, if he beheld a youth with languorous sigh, gazing upon a lady fixedly, the prince would to his comrades jesting cry, Lo there a wretch who to his liberty would set a bound, it vexes him so nigh. And in you damsel's hand would bind it fain, mark ye his thoughts, how idle fond they are and vain. What is it in womankind faith to repose, whose heart turns in one day a thousand ways, like to a leaf if breeze upon it blows, nor doth a lover's care within her raise, one pang of grief, nor is there one who knows, what silly whim shall next command her praise, O oh, happy is the man who's never taken, with idle love for her, who's brave yet to abstain. From mine own folly I have knowledge gained, who suffered his cursed flames in me to burn, so, said I now love never with me maintained, a gracious mien but rather did me spurn, Giving me naught, my words were false and feigned. Yet love's gifts gathered prove a poor return. His cheer affords no boon of certain joy. 
compared with lover's woes and lover's sad annoy, that I am free my thanks I him accord, whose mercy proved far higher than my own. Almighty Jove, true deity and lord, of every grace to me, who not overthrown, by love must live, but glad to see adored. Fair maids by other youths may move alone, steering an easy course, and laugh to scorn, all such pale, troubled lovers with their moods forlorn. O blindness of man's dull and earthly mind, too oft the end will man's forethought believe, and bring effect of far contrary kind. Satiric Troilo would fain decry, their silly faults whom love doth anxious bind, nor dreams that heaven doth even now espy. Some means to break his pride that love's sharp darts will pierce him ere he from that festive temple parts. Pursuing then love's followers to deride, this one or that, the while his idle gaze, reviewed the damsels there on every side, perchance his wandering eye with great amaze. Mid ladies fair hath Chrysase a speed, traversing daintily those thronged ways. Her garb still russet neath a veil milk white, in that so solemn festival a pleasing sight. This Chrysase was tall, of stately height, where to her members were proportioned well, a beauty born of fair celestial might, adorned her winsome face, sans parallel, yea, for her features shone serenely bright, with womanly noblesse, when, subtly, fell, touched by her arm, her mantle from her face, as toward all the crowd that swarmed about the place, which graceful gesture pleased young Troilo, so in the movement showed her dainty pride, as if she said, may not a white stand so? And mute he gazed upon her face and stride, which, as he looked, did ever fairer grow, more worthy praise, and now first he espied. How sweet it is to gaze in joy and grace, from soul to soul, on lucent eyes and heavenly face. And he no jot perceived, who'd been so shrewd, before to censure love in other men, that Amor dwelling in the ray unviewed. Of her bright eyes aimed true his dart just then, nor did that weapon, deep with love imbrued, of his late taunts remind him once again, what time he scorned love's languorous retinue. For still of love's sweet sting the prince but little knew, beneath her mantle's folds so pleasingly, and peerless too, the face of Chrysase shone, that Troil gazed thereon in ecstasy, held by a cause he could not name if known, only he knew a high will now to see, to be less far, to keep his thoughts his own, to love and win, when Pallas's rights were passed. He stood there still, hardly his comrades stirred him at the last, not as he entered there so free and gay. The prince made exit from the temple now, but pensive, all enamored, went his way, beyond his own belief, with solemn vow, to keep well hid his new desire, and say, no word nor that his recent prate allow, henceforth expressed, lest on himself be turned the ridicule his ardor would have meetly earned, when from that spacious temple now had moved. This Chrysase, too, then Chang Troilo, joined his companions and the hours improved, by making with them blithe and merry show, and tarried long, and that, his wound beloved, better to hide, kept all his jests aglow, over men that love, saying how differently. His own heart fared, and bade all go and be as free, at length, his comrades separating all, the prince sought out alone his chamber room, and there to sighing let his fancy fall, stretched on his bed, and now would fain resume, the pleasure of his morning fain recall, the charming aspect of sweet Chrysae's bloom, counting the beauties of her lovely face, commending this or that part for its charm and grace, he praised her conduct and her stately size, saying she showed her heart's munificence, both in her mien and gait, what high emprise, to win a lady of such excellence, and have her love, O oh, matchless, matchless prize, if to his wooing in pure innocence, she could consent, could love as he loved now. And, smiling on her servant, accept her servant's vow, he told himself no labor and no sigh, expended in her service could be lost, thought his desire would win applause most high. If told to friends who chanced him to a cost, reasoned his fellows would not now decry, his love, knowing the pain wherein he tossed, then gladly argued he could hold his peace, unwitting how soon cheer and joy on cease, disposed to follow then such fair fortune, to act in everything discreet he planned, 
with thought to hide his ardor as a boon. Too rich for common use by vulgar hand, a thing conceived in amorous mind and tune. From every friend, from every servant bland, unless some need compel, for love in truth. To many known brings joy with much commingled ruth, such thoughts and others now he entertained. How to disclose his love and how attract, the favor of sweet Chrysais, undisdained, and, after this, conformed his every act, to songs of hope and passion unrestrained. To love one lady only is his pact, holding at naught all ladies seen before. However they had pleased, they could not please him more. And such a time to love he turned his praise, with pettiest speech, fair lord, thou dost possess. The soul I claimed as mine in other days, but that thou ownst it now, I would confess, doth please me well. Yet, in my strange amaze, I know not if my heart is given less, goddess or dame to serve so fair the may. I saw in milk-white veil and russet dress today. In her bright eyes thou hast thy dwelling place. O verily, my lord, and it is meet, thou have it there, and therefore of thy grace. I pray thee, love, to hold my service sweet. Make it more thine, and on thy servant's case. Look thou in pity, for prostrate at thy feet. My heart now lies where thy darts struck it low, when out of Chryses' eyes they shot in one swift blow. My royal blood thy flames in no way spare, nor yet the strength and courage of my mind, nor for my hardihood aught do they care. For Troilo's sturdy frame with valor lined, they burn unchecked, like fire beyond compare, kindled mid-matter dry and unconfined, and so they spread within this lover new, that all his members they with love and heat endue, thenceforth from day to day with fervent thought, and pleasure thence derived, the prince prepared. More dry and amorous fuel, fancy fraught, within his lofty heart, and even dared. Imagine, too, from Chrysaeus' eyes was caught, a balm to cool the flame therein that flared. So secret then, to see them oft he tried, and how much more that fanned the flame he never descried. And now, wherever his sojourn he might make, wherever he went or sat, by day or night, attended or alone for musing's sake, eating or drinking, still the lovely sight, of Chrysaeus' eyes his every thought would take, and ever their beauty's worth he would recite, declaring her fair face would Helen's shame, and, certain, far surpass Polyxena's in fame, no single hour of the day now passed, wherein he did not cry, O gracious light, and this a thousand times, which lately hast, shown in my heart by Cupid's grace and might, O Chrysaeus fair, the wonder unsurpassed, of thy sweet face which keeps me pale and white. Convert, somehow to pity, let it be, my joy, my aid that springs alone entire from thee. And now his every erstwhile dream was fled, of fame he might win in the mighty war, of health or safety, and of fancy led, alone within his breast the amorous lore, of his fair lady's virtue spoke instead, and by it gladly stayed now more and more. He only yearned the wounds of love to cure and to that task put all his mind and joyance pure. From reveries of love he was not stirred, even by his sharing in those battles fought, and stern assaults fierce joined at Hector's word, wherein he with his brothers moved, but caught. With growing wonder, now the Trojans heard, or as they followed cheered his fierce onslaught, or stopped to see the marvel flash in arms, his courage never daunted in the great alarms. But t'was no hate for Greeks that moved him so, nor victory desired great Troy to free, Troy which he saw so straitened by her foe, in that great siege, but in him secretly, his will still clutched at glory, urged him go, down in the field for love's felicity, Chrysaeus' favor won, and, if the story's true, his mere approach the Greeks in mortal terror threw, and so had a more robbed him of his sleep, his appetite depressed, and earnest thought, so in him multiplied, that pallor deep, spread over his face the while he toiled and fought, as if it would belie his deeds and weep. But spite of it, with laughter feigned he sought, and speaking blithe to cover up his pain, till Troy believed t'was only war he felt his bane, whatever in all this still remains unsure. Whether Christ says did not once suspect, the love this Troyal strove to hide secure, or feigning not to know it did elect, 
this much is clear and must as truth endure. That nothing, it appeared, the lady wrecked, of all the love her lover toward her bore, but stood, like one unloved, unsoftened, evermore. Whence Troilo such grievous dolor knew, he could not name it even, and much he sighed, lest Chrysaeus should with greater favor view, some other knight, and therefore should deride, his love, if known, and all his service true, reject, and now a myriad ways he tried, in his mind's eye to make his lady feel, how honest was his love, how fervid and how real. And then, when it had stung him thus a space, the prince began of love to make a moan, saying within, Lo, Troil, there thy place, where thou didst others mock, to stand alone. Never was a lover brought so in disgrace, since how to keep from love he had not known. Thou art taken in the net thou censured hast, because thou didst not wisely guard thee at the last. What will be said of thee mid other knights? Who love, if this thy love becometh known? Will they not revel in new gibes and slights, or cry at thee, the railers overthrown? No more so seer-like proud the prince indites, our sighs and every low-breathed amorous moan. Behold the bitter bitten, love be praised, who to such end hath brought the scorner lately crazed, Mong men of prowess, now what will be said? Of thee, deemed once a lord of royal might, once this is known, displeased it is no dread, they'll cry, Lo there, our prince, the hair-brained white, gone from his mind, caught now by love and led, ensnared away in Troy's sore hour of plight, when in the war his valor should be brought. He stays, and lets love's fire consume his every thought. Would that, O thou most dolorous Troilo, since it is suffered thee to love one now. Thou wert enamored of some gentler foe, who pitying would console thee for thy vow, feeling a love like thine, but Chryseis low, for whom thou sighst, will no sweet love allow, within her stony breast at evening, ice, though thou, like snow in fire, mayst melt within a trice. Would I were safe ashore within that port, whither my misadventure hasteneth me, t'would prove my blessing and a high comfort, for dying there would end my mortal dree. Whereas, unknown as yet to all report, if mine unhappiness my comrades see, a thousand gibes will fill my life each day, and more, I shall be called a blockhead every way. O oh, aid me, love, I plead, and thou for whom, enchained now more than other knights I weep, vouchsafe some pity for thy lover's doom, who more than life loves thee with ardor deep. Turn thou thy face's power to a loom, upon thy knight, Grant love his way to keep. For in these sighs for thee he holds me straight. Refuse not kindness to my sad despaired state. Yet if thou must refuse my poor request, like vernal bloom I'll early fade away. Waiting shall then no more my peace molest, nor seeing thy high pride my soul dismay. But should such course aggrieve thee this behest, ready in all to please, I crave today. Cry, cruel, slay thyself, Sir Troilo and I to give thee plaisance will do even so. This and full many other pleas he made, deep plunged in sighs and weeping calling out, her name like one whose love is undismayed, even in the uttermost of grief and doubt, but to his plaints he found no mercy stayed, all were but leaves blown in the wind about, and lost, none reaching Chrysaces ear, and thence grew every day his torment and his fear. Canto two. So lasted many moons his pensive mood, till one day, in his chamber all alone, a Trojan youth, of courage high imbued, an ancient lineage born, slipped in unknown, and there his friend the woeful prince first viewed, melted to wretched tears and lying prone, upon his couch. And how now, friend, he cried, doth this our bitter hour so conquering over thee ride, and him the prince quick queried, Pandaro, what chance hath led thee here to see me die? if to our friendship any debt thou owe. Away with thee, be gone, O oh, let me lie, disconsolate, for this of truth I know, of all my friends thou wouldst to see me die, be saddened most, and I thrive not in life, so conquered is my strength, so battered by its strife, yet do not think it is the siege of Troy, or any task of arms or any fear, occasions me my present great annoy, mid other cares that one doth least appear, Tis other grief that would my life destroy. That makes me craven neath its wounds severe. But what it is, seek not to know, my friend. 
Twere best I speak it not, but hide it to the end. In Pandaro an instant pity grew, and earnest wish sad Troil's pain to know. Whence he at once appealed, let friendship true, as formerly, twas wont, reveal thy woe. To me, thy friend, lest further ill ensue. Wherefore so fain to join the shades below, it cannot be thou hold it friendly act. To hide from me, thy friend, the cause thou art so racked, fain would I share with thee this grief and woe. If I can bring no ease to thine annoy, because friends must them ever willing show, to share all things, their sorrows and their joy, that I have loved thee thou dost truly know. Methinks, in good and ill with fair employ, dost truly know I'd render any feat. Thou mightst require of me, or as a friend entreat. The prince sighed deep before he answer made. O pander mine, since nothing thee can please, except thou know what woe hath me dismayed, I'll yield and tell thee briefly my disease. Not in the hope that through thy proffered aid, I may somehow secure my spirit peace, but feeling I must satisfy thy prayer, to which I know not how to make denial fair. Love, gainst whom, if any try defense, too soon he's caught and finds his efforts vain. Flames now my heart with such all pleasant sense, I have no power thence to remove his reign. Henceforth, and this now me so sore repents, as thou canst see, my hand I scarce restrain, and scarce have checked its thousandth trial and fervent wish somehow to end my life most vile. Let this suffice thee, sweet and worthy friend, to know then these my griefs which hitherto I have revealed to none, and God forfend. If to my love thou wouldst hold thee loyal true, that thou disclose my eager amorous end, and fervent wish, lest added ill ensue, thou knowst now what I will, go thou, I pray, and let me fight alone my anxious fears today. And Pandar answered, Couldst thou hope to hide? So long from me thy great love's secret fire, from me who would my wits have glad it applied, and found some means thy comfort to inspire, and sense of peace. But Troila replied, Comes aid from thee, whom ever loves desire. I see tormenting, O thou hapless wight, who thinkst with thine own frailty to relieve my plight. Where do Pandaro urged, I know, my lord. Tis sooth thou speak'st, yet oftentimes twill fall, who doth to others counsel him accord, from venom saves himself and other gall, and sure it is the blind can ill afford, to take those paths which seeing men appall. And though no man may for himself prove wise, he can give others aid when others' perils rise. I too have loved through much despairing hap, and still I love of my perversity, and must perforce keep me within the trap, because I have not loved in secrecy. Like thee, and God my folly wills, mayhap, but that all loyal love I've given thee. I bear thee still, and will preserve so well. No man shall ever know the secret thou shalt tell. Rest then in me, my friend, thy trust secure, and tell me all that causes this thy plight. What makes thy life so noxious to endure? Fear not I shall assume the scorner's right, to mock thy love, for men that feel most sure, within their wisdom would all deem it light. To claim love can be wrested from the heart, ere long besieging time hath willed it to depart. Leave then thine anguish, cease thy sighs, and, reasoning, alleviate thy grief. So, make thy sufferings in fear arise, and pass, their pain becoming yet more brief. They who feel love alike make best allies. Whenever a lover's seen, tis my belief, and I, as thou too know'st against my will, do love, and nothing can allay or soothe my ill. Perchance the lovely one that troubles thee, I can even to thy pleasure somehow bend. More gladly thy will satisfied I'd see, if so might be than mine own please, my friend. Wouldst thou perceive it so, declare to me, her name whose charms do so much pain portend. Up, youth, lie not so prone. Think thou canst speak. With me as to thyself entrust both firm and meek, sometime the anxious Troilo refrained breathe deep, but could not check his bitter sighs. While shame his countenance with blushes stained, then answered, Pandar, friend, true friend and wise, of honest cause my will were best constrained. I should not speak my love before thy eyes, for she from whom I trace my grief so sore, I as of thy kin, and shame-faced he could say no more, and there at Troil on his bed supine, fell wild with weeping and there hid his face. 
to whom good pander cried, O comrade mine, should fear so easy over trust game place, within thy breast, cease, craven to repine, lest to thy weeping I my death should trace, should she thou lovest my own sister prove, gladly with all my power I'd help thee win her love, up then, my friend, and tell me who is she, tell me at once that I may see straightway, to thy sweet comfort sweetest care for me, in mine own mansion doth this lady stay, tell me, I pray, whoever she may be, for I go pondering who should be the may, and I'll be certain scarce six days shall speed, ere I shall rest thee from this grievous state and need, to these pleas Troilo would answer naught, and every moment closed his lips more tight, but, as his ears Pandaro's promise caught, within himself he felt his hopes more bright, and now he yearned to speak, and now he fought, his silence to maintain with all his might, ashamed to loose his tongue, but Pandar urged. At last he turned, and weeping forth his words now surged. My Pandar, I could wish that I were dead, rather than thinking of love's wound in me. If by concealing it no pain were bred, no wrong to thee I'd still act feigningly, but more I cannot, and, if thou art led, wisely as is thy want, well canst thou see. Love doth not wish that man should love by law, save that one law which man's own appetite doth draw. For lawless love makes men sometimes desire, their sisters, girls their brothers wickedly, makes daughters love their fathers and with fire. For sons-in-law fills Beldame sans degree, making poor whites despite themselves aspire for good or ill to know love's ecstasy. I love your cousin Cresace, he said, mouthing his words and wept and fell back on his bed, when Pandar now had heard the lady's name. At first he laughed, then answered, Troilo, by heaven I beg thee, friend, to change thy game, of idly weeping, since love hath loved thee so, pointing toward such a place thy amorous flame. It could not toward a worthier lady blow. The may such beauteous grace is hers and rare, in all her soul is worthy of thy love, I'd swear. No lover's friend was ever worthier, more affable or sweeter in converse. No lady could more grateful pleasant stir, and poet could not of a queen rehearse. Virtues more rare than those that dwell in her. Yea, of a truth they would transcend all verse, for she is peerless. Never a king could hold. His heart in check should she her love to him unfold. Besides these graces named another one, to thee of evil omen, Doth my cousin vaunt, lady more chaste than she there liveth none, and all love's charms fall scorned beneath her taunt. But gainst this virtue I'll find words to run, if other mishap enter not to daunt. Our hopes, and win thy need, have patience now, and curb thy ardent love with every act and vow. Well canst thou see, therefore, that love hath stirred, thy passion for one worth thy valiant name. Stand therefore steadfast, both in act and word, Expect, too, full success in thy new game, which presently on thee will be conferred, should not thy weeping its rare price disclaim. Worthy thou art of her and she of thee, and I will work the thing with ingenuity. Think not, my prince, I do not clear discern, that such amours unseemly oft appear, to worthy dames and may some evil turn, on me, or her, or hers, and much I fear, lest rashness should us, Justly, trouble earn, or our fair scheme reach to the vulgar ear, and Chrysaeus, reputed now sans stain, bring scorn on her through love, revilement, and disdain. But since thy passion is forbidden sway, and chance to act and must too all unknown, remain to men, it seems to me the way. That one may wisest take is Amor's own, no lover should his appetite allay, who keeps not all his acts to one shrewd tone lest any blush should come upon that dame, whose honor he would guard from every ill and shame. Methinks no woman lives who doth not will, to live full amorously, tis only fear, lest shame befall that curbs and keeps her still. But if to cure this dread some means appear, some honest medicine her wish to fill. Foolish is he who scorns her favors dear. My cousin, though a widow, craves no less. The joy of love, whatever denial, would the truth suppress. Since then I feel thee prudent now and wise. I ween I can please well the two of you, giving to each a joy that each will prize, if but ye keep it from the public view, as if it were not, some grievous fault would rise, as mine and chide me should I fail to do. 
all in my power for thee. My friend, be shrewd. Hide safe thy axe meantime from vulgar eyes and rude. The words he heard made Troilo content. So mightily in mind it seemed indeed. He had already scaped his whole torment. And thereat love flamed up again with speed. Although he waited for a time attent. As if his fare might have still further read he. At last he spake. O friend, thou speakest fair. In praising her, but my eyes find her still more rare. Then say how shall my inner fury bait. My ardor high, more high did no man see. The lady, when of my deep love's estate, she hath discerned a lack it well may be, will doubtful prove or yet more obstinate. To my despair, scorn it for fear of thee, and even moved her heart so to seem chaste. To thee she might not listen to thy words with haste. And further, Pandar mine, my wish is now. Thou shouldst not deem it ever my desire. The lady once to villainy should bow. Her love I wish sought, but with honor's fire. Sans other means employed. And this I vow. Gained so, in me, t'would sovereign grace inspire. Seek this means then, and more I shall not pray. The prince blushed deep and turned his shame-struck face away. To him then, laughing, Pandar quick replied. In this thou sayst no folly can be traced. Let me but act. In me thy faith confide. For in my hands are rare powers firmly placed, sermons to make love stir wherever they're tried. And all my aims with gains are ever graced, whenever new ends I seek. This task be mine, and in an ending sweet thy will shall be all thine. Thereat the prince leaped lightly from his bed, kissed and embraced full ardently his friend, swearing to win the war the Greek hosts led, was no such task to him as to contend. Against that ardor which his passion fed, O Pandaro, my heart I recommend, to thy best aid, thou shrewd and prudent knight, who canst bring end to sorrow means to love's delight, desirous then to serve the royal youth, whom much he loved, this Pandar took his leave, hoping some pleasure might afford him Ruth, and sought out Chrysaes, him to relieve, who, as she saw him come, arose in sooth, and with fair greetings did her guest receive. First Pandar hath her fingers lightly caught, and with her then a sheltered loggia sought, and there with laughter, in parleying sweet, with merry words and all that gay converse, which kin are wont to use, and which most meet, those close in blood do knowingly rehearse. Pandaro played a while with will to treat, his cherished scheme as if it were the reverse, or of but trifling worth, then sudden gazed, so fixed in Chrysaeus's face she might well grow amazed, and as she caught thus fixed, his gaze, she smiled, then cried, Hast never seen my face before. What subtlety hath now thy mind beguiled? To what intent? And Pandaro but swore, Thou know'st I viewed thy beauty from a child, But never hath it charmed my vision more. Then now, and heaven thou mayest praise and thank, No fairer dame than thou appears in any rank. Where to the lady begged, What praise is this? Wherefore pronounce me fairer than of yore? to whom he quickly answered, full of bliss, because thy face would make all men adore, none being in the world so fair, why wis, and now, unless I am deceived the more, it doth a well-made knight so wholly please, he boasts his love for thee, even though from love her flees, and Chrysaeus thereon blushed so modestly. Hearing the words her cousin Pandar spake, she seemed a morning rose so fair was she. Then from her lips such words as, these did break. Make not thy mock of me, who joyous see. Whatever gifts to thee the kind gods make, he must have little gear, this man I please. Since birth I have not charmed a white with equal ease. Let be thy words, our Pandar made reply. Declare if of his love thou art aware, to whom she answered, if I do not die. No one man more than other hold I fair. True, tis from time to time I do espy. A passing knave who at my door will stare, but whether he is looking there for me, or of another dreams I know not certainly. In answer Pandor queried, Who is he? And Chrysaeus replied again, In sooth, I know him not, nor can I tell to thee, more than I've told, and inward of a truth. Pandaro reasoned, The prince this cannot be, some other woos, then quick to serve the youth. He ventured more, This man thou set in flame is known of all, and one too that deserves his fame. Who can, 
Then Chrysase quoth, take such delight, in merely seeing me, if I may ask, where to this pandar with evasion slight. O damsel, since God wrought creation's task, made the first man there breathe no truer white, nor held more perfect soul in human mask, than he whom I shall name, whose love is such. One could not say a man had ever loved so much. He is of spirit and of lineage proud, an honest man who holds his honor dear. With natural wit is no man more endowed, nor lives in other science even his peer. Valor and zeal are in his face avowed. I cannot tell you all his virtue clear. O oh, happy is thy beauty, which hath stirred. A man so made to hold thee to all dames preferred. Well is the jewel suited to the ring. If, as thou beauteous art, so provest thou wise. If thou become his fief in anything. As he hath thine become, a star will rise. In union with the sun, no luck could bring to fair a demoiso in amorous ties, a fairer damoiselle, be thou but coy. Blessed art thou, if thou wilt consummate thy joy. One only opportunity appears, to every one who lives that he may seize, and whoever lets it come and pass, in tears. That man must grieve that it so rapid flees, blaming himself, and now to thee it nears. Drawn by the might of thy fair face to please, employ thou it while I, more luckless born, Weep that God, fate, the world allowed me only scorn. Are these true words, or wouldst thou tempt me ill? Or art thou from thy wits? Gasped Chryses dumb. What man or knight should of me have his will, save he had first my married lord become? Yet say what man is this, an alien still, or citizen, on whom such pain hath come? For love of me, speak, if thou oughtest, speak and do not merely cry thy bootless sighs so meek. And Pandar answered, Citizen is he, yet none of mean degree, my greatest friend, from whose full breast, perhaps through destiny, this secret I've disclosed I late did rend, and now he lives in plaint and misery. Such fire thy glorious face doth in him send. Know therefore now that he that loves thee so, desires thee so, is no man less than Troilo. Sometime Chrysaes stood in mute amaze, her eyes on Pandaro until she grew, pale as a dawn's most gray and sunless rays, wishing her tear-bright eyes were less in view, afraid her tears should flow their several ways, or, unstemmed in their course, her cheeks in dew. Then, gaining speech, she murmured in surprise, with many a halting breath and many fearful sighs, I had believed, my cousin Pandaro, if ever I had so far in folly run, as redilessly to love Prince Troilo. Thou wouldst have whipped me as a shameless one. Thou wouldst have sworn I shamed my kindred so, disgraced my parents with the deed I'd done. Now thou dost urge I follow love's mad way. Could strangers urge me worse or read than that I pray? Troil, I know, is valorous and great. So brave a queen should find in him content. But since my dear lord's death, unhappy fate, always my heart has vowed with true intent, never to love again, my widow's state, always must be of grief and deep lament. My only joy is memory of him, my only wish that memory may never dim. Yet were there living man my love might win, surely that man should be thy Troilo, could I be sure he felt true joy therein. Once it was given, but cousin, thou must know. Such ecstasies as Troil now is in, do commonly befall, and even so. Last but four days or six, for over the night, Men's thoughts do change their love, and men seek new delight. Let me continue such a life to lead, as fate hath thought it fair to offer me, and he will find some lady fair indeed, whom he may love at will, for modesty. Tis meet I save my honor for my need, and Pandaro let not this answer be, for God's sweet sake, to thee a cause of grief, but seek thou other pleasures to yield thy prince relief. Within him Pandar felt his cousin's scorn, the while the lady's speech he patient heard then rose as one who thought his cause forlorn, as if to go, paused, turned, resumed his word, and cried, Sweet cause, to thee in praise I've borne, such honor as with joy I'd see conferred, on my own sister, daughter, even wife, if with such pleasant kindred God had blessed my life, and since I feel the prince is worth much more, than ever thy love could be, and yesterday, because I saw him for it in a plight so sore. I am myself much grieved, alack the day, 
believe thou wilt not, nor his pain deplore. But yet I know thy hardness would give way, if thou, like me, didst all his ardor know. Then wouldst thou, for my sake, take pity on his woe, discreet as he or of a faith is great. I do not think in all the world is night, nor loyal friend as he in any state. And friend could not desire thee with more might. Tis meet thou love him, cease thy foolish prate, of widow's weeds, and grant thy youth its right. Waste not thy time, remember how dull death, or age may catch thy charms away like idle breath. Alack, quoth Chrysaes, thou speakest true. The years recede and youth's frail charms decay, and, ere love's path in full celestial hue, hath bloomed, we pass in dusty death away. But let me still in thought this truth review, and tell me if of love at this late day, I yet may joy and solace have, and how, and why thou learnst the love of Troilo but now. Full shrewd our Pandar smiled, then made reply, All will I tell, since thou desirest to know, two days ago when spears did quiet lie, because a truce was made, Prince Troilo, would find diversion in a wood nearby, so begged I with him to the place should go, and straying there from me he gan to sigh, and presently I heard him sing of love and cry. I stood apart, but, hearing his complaint, murmured full low, I moved near to attend, and well I can his words from memory paint, he grieved and prayed love should his torment end, crying, O sovereign lord, my brow grows faint, so sore my sighs and passion do me rend, my heart is racked for her sweet beauty's sake. Her charms have caught me so their bonds can never break. Where her fair image more than others fair, I carry sweet portrayed thou makest stay, and there dost see my conquered soul laid bare, and pensive made by thine effulgent ray, which holds it straight within and girt with care, begging the while it find that peace some way, which only my fair mistress's loosened eyes can ever grant to it, sweet lord, in any wise. If then unwilling thou my death would see, Make known my grief, party, to this fair dame. Beseech and win of her that joy for me, which only to thy subject peace can name. Will not, my lord, that I die instantly, or let my anxious soul now cease to frame. The cry it ever makes, all night and day, such fear it hath because grief hath no power to slay. It cannot be, my lord, thou'lst hesitate, to light thy flame beneath her widow's weeds. No greater honor could thee celebrate. Enter her breast with that desire that breeds such pain in mine, I pray thee not too late. Feel that, O pious Lord, to do so thou must needs, so that, through thee, her sweet and languid sighs may bear some comfort to my heart's sad yearning cries. And these words murmured, Troil deeply sighed. First bowed his head to say, I know not what. Then, growing silent, only wept and cried. Through me, who saw, at once suspicion shot whence flowed his tears, and I did then decide, should ever time fit such a harmless plot, to laugh one day and ask what meant his song, and what occasioned him to keep that mien so long. But time to this did first today agree, when, entering, I found the night alone, within his room even as I thought t'would be. There on his bed he lay like any stone, though quick he turned toward on seeing me, lest I should aught suspect why he did groan. Yet as I nearer drew again, he wept and grief through him once more its cruel passion swept. As best I could, I sought to comfort him, and with new art and diverse tricks of speech, I drew from him what was his trouble dim, giving him, ere he'd speak, my pledge in each, that on my faith I'd tell no man his whim. Then pity moved me to come here and teach, thee of his love, whom I have fully told. Of that he begs thee much not from him to withhold, and thou, what wilt thou, be so lofty proud, and let him go who finds himself no cure, for loving thee to death the fell endowed, or cruel fate or mischance else endure, for loving thee must he die unavowed, if thou to him with thy fair visage pure, and loosened eyes could be in aught less dear, then only couldst thou save him from the death now near. At length Chrysaeus answered, unaware. His secret thou hast caught from out his breast, the while he mused, though firm he held it there until thou found'st him to his tears addressed, prone on his bed. May God now yield him fair. Make me no less than him to feel I'm blessed. For, through thy speech, strange pity stirs in me, who am in naught so harsh as I may seem to be. 
Sometimes she paused, then, sighing deep, pursued, almost transfixed. Alas, I see it well. Where leads thy pious wish when closely viewed, but that I granted devoir doth compel, and pleasing thee, and he is worthily endued, suffice it thee I see him, and then tell, how I, if he be sage, may scape all shame, escape even worse, perhaps, and seem in naught to blame. Sweet sister mine, quick pander then replied, thou sayest well his shrewdness I'll demand, though I am sure he hath no guile inside. So courteous he is, his heart so grand. Save some mischance hath newly changed its pride. God save him I from every lawless stand. But I'll find thee such grace, twill pleasure thee. Dwell thou secure in God and to thy devoir see, Pandaro went, and Chrysace moved apart, pondering the news and every tiniest word, brought by her cousin with Dias pleasant art, then sought her room where deep her fancies stirred. How all was said she mused deep in her heart. She reasoned joy like hers but rare occurred, talking within herself, and oft she sighed, picturing the prince in all his fame and pride. Young am I yet noble and blithe and fair, widowed indeed, but rich and still admired, nay even loved, childless and free as air. May I not then by love again be fired, and though my honor should perchance declare, this must thou not, I'll act as one inspired. Be shrewd, conceal my will, and none will know. My heart hath willed new love, sad plaisance and sweet woe. My youth, as all youth, speeds it toward decay, and should I lose it then so wretchedly? In all this world I cannot find today, woman without a lover, nay more I see, and know it well, to love is all men's way. And shall I lose my time in nullity, to act as other mortals is no sin, and blame from any one my actions cannot win? What man will want me, grown to older age, no one forsooth, in late years to repent, will add but more woes to a grievous stage, and futile prove my hours in mourning spent. Alack words then, why felt I not love's rage? Wise it will be to act full provident. Fair is this man who loves thee, gentle, wise, fresh as the charm that in a garden lily lies, for royal blood and valor too supreme. Pandar, thy cousin, praises Troilo. Why then to thee should it unworthy seem, to take him to thy heart and let him know? Why not accord him every love and dream? Dost not thou hear the pity of his woe? Oh, what rare bliss thou mightest with him see! Couldst thou but love him now as he in sooth loves thee? Yet tis no time of marriage ties for me, and were it so, one's freedom to maintain. To use at will is wiser rule, I see. Always that love proves lover's richer gain, which grows from friendship's sweet felicity, and however great one's beauty may remain. How sure are we twill not our husband's tire? who have each every day some fresh thing in desire, as furtive water gives a sweeter taste than wine that's drunk too copiously to one. So is love's joy that hides long unembraced. By any husband, the sweeter felt when won. Tis meet then thou, sans proving thee less chaste. Receive this prince so sweet to look upon, whom God hath yielded thee by sovereign grace, and to his ardent love grant him a fairer place. Sometimes she stood, then sudden turned about, and softly cried, O wretched one, within, what wilt thou do? The evil life, no doubt, that moves with love in love's sweet languid sin, thou know'st in all its size a dreary rout, and all the plaints and griefs that dwell therein. And to them all, so close joined jealousy, that worse than churlish death our living comes to be. And as for him who so doth love thee now, he is a prince of loftiest birth and rank. Out of thy star his wish to keep love's vow may burn away, and if it fadeth blank, sorrow will be thy portion thou wilt bow, broken beneath thy shame with him to thank, only for having scorned thee. O oh, beware, wisdom that follows scandal hath no value rare. And even if this love should long endure, how canst thou know it will remain concealed? Foolish it is to trust to fortune's lure, and whatever profit human counsel yield, Tis well to scan it close, of this be sure. If this thy love be ever to men revealed, then is thy good fame lost eternally. Lost here in Troy, which so much praised thy chastity, then let such love henceforth for them remain, whom it doth please. 
Such were the words she said, and thereupon began her sighs again, from her chaste breast with all her hardy head. She strove to drive Troilo's face, in vain. Blame turned to praise and praise to blame instead, the while she weighed his charms in reverie, or raised within herself sweet doubts with subtlety. Meantime, blithe Pandar, leaving Chrysace, had straightway gone to Troilo, his friend. No wit he lingered, so he felt in bliss. And yet far off, he cried words to this end. Comfort thee, brother, since for thee we wis, I've gained all that to which thy wishes bend, or near to it, and taking seat, he said. Without a pause, how everything he did had sped, as flowers bent and closed by chilly night, open their eager faces in the morn, when on their stalks the sun shines warm and white. So Troilo then his valor, late forlorn, opened again beholding heaven's light, and recommenced again, like person noble born, to Venus and her puissance be the praise, and to her son, of all the words my song shall raise. Then Pandar he a thousand times embraced, and kissed him just as oft so glad was he, that if a thousand Troys had there been placed, as gifts to him he could not gladder be. Then slow with Pandar forth his steps he traced, hoping he might Chrysae's beauty see, or, gazing closely, might even too detect. If Pandaro's late words in her it had effect, and from her window low the lady gazed, perhaps she trusted he might soon draw near. And as he looked our trail grew amazed, for nothing wild or stern did she appear. But, with her right hand over her breast upraised, she chastely looked on him with mien sincere, and thereupon the prince stole off in joy changing his praise to God, to Pandar, and to Venus's boy. And now all that dilemma fled away. The witch held Chrysae's between two fires. Within she praised his manners every way, his quiet acts, his courteous desires. So suddenly love seized her that sweet day, that henceforth only him her heart requires. And much she grieves the precious time let go, ere all his perfect love to her she came to know. Troilo sings and makes great holiday and offers jousts and gifts most lavishly. Often he changes garb to seem more gay, and always yet he loves more fervidly, is pleased to find it is no grievous way to follow love and her discreetly see. When Chrysais, who was nothing less discreet, appeared at times in beauty fair and all complete, but as from ancient habit still we see, fire burns more brightly when we fuel add, it chanceth oft, as hope, grows more to be. Love flames with newer power, keen but sad. So Troilo now felt more grievously. Then it was used, his high heart's wish grow mad, and goad him forward, whence his woeful sighs, more sad and plaintive than before, began to rise. Henceforth the prince with Pandar often grieved, crying, Alack, fair Chrysais hath taken my life from me, and all that it relieved, with her fair eyes, and so I'm bound in pain. I must soon die, be not some help received. So mad, so hot, love burns my heart again. What shall I do? Must I abide content, merely to know her grace and courteous intent? She looks on me and suffers that I gaze. In honor too on her, this ought to be. Enough for my inflamed desires to praise. But my love's lust in its cupidity yearns still for more. So unbound are those ways, in which its ardor moves that none could see who had not felt the same, or yet believe, how that flame ever torments and new force doth receive, what shall I then? I know not what to do, except proclaim thou, Chrysais, art fair, or cry that thou alone canst aid me true, esteemed lady with thy virtues rare. Thou only canst my ceaseless fire subdue, sweet light, sweet flame, my heart's sweet joy and care. Could I be with thee for one vernal night? A hundred nights in hell I'd pay for its delight. What shall I, Pandar? Wilt thou nothing say? Thou seest me in such furious fire consumed, yet shapest thy face in that thy quiet way, as if for all the sighs to which I'm doomed. Thou hadst no mind. Aid me, my friend, I pray. Counsel me, lest my pain be all resumed, for comes no succor soon from her. I care not when death's nets may trip me sands my stir. And Pandar answered, well, indeed, I see, and hear thy say, but true to aid thy pain. I never yet thought I had ability, nor never will, yet always am I fain, to do not only what befits for thee, but all things else, 
without thy force to train, my will or thine entreaty, let me view. All open, then, the fiery wish thou seemest to rue. I know that in whatever events befall, thou seest six times as much as I, my friend, yet were I thou, I'd write to her of all, say with my hand what pain my heart did rend, and therein I should make my prayer a call, a plea through God she to my ardor bend, with love and courteous thought of me, and what I wrote to her I'd send immediately, and furthermore, if thou wilt to her write, I will beseech her that she pity thee, with all my power, and thou shalt see it right, whatever she answers, faith is sure in me, that her reply will bring thee rare delight. Write then, and let her in thy letter see, all whole thy faith, thy pain, and thy desire. Nothing omit, but all thou spakest here express entire. This answer more than pleased our Troilo, but as a timid lover he replied, Alas, my Pandar, soon thou'lt see and know, as others do, how nicely ladies pride, themselves on seeming chaste, and rode I so. And didst thou her my letter bear, she'd chide, thee first for shame, reject it then for scorn, so that my state would be in misery more forlorn. But Pandar, answering evasive, said, Do prithee what I say, and let me try, and should love with her favor me bestead. Certain I am to bring thee her reply, and in her own hand writ, refuse instead. And thou mayst longer sad and fearful sigh, thou mayst repeat then all of thy torment, and I shall have no power to make thee more content. And then the prince cried, Yielding, have thy will. I shall go now incontinent and write, beseeching Amor he the way fulfill, with every boon and all my words indite. And thereupon he rose in manner still, and sought his room, and, sagely as he might, he wrote to Chryses, his lady dear. His letter, then at once, whose words ye now shall hear. Lady, if man in sorest dolor found, held by complaints and other hard estate, as I for thy sake now am held and bound, could fitly bid thee hail and happy fate, then might I try, but ever my words must sound. Futile and hopeless, words of poorest rate. Troilo cannot hail thee, as is meet, even though from only thee his life knows what is sweet. And yet I cannot flee great Amor now, who meaner men than me hath rendered bold, for Amor prompts these words that I avow. And write, even as thou seest, and I must hold, his laws all in esteem, to them must bow. Wherefore, if through me error now is told, blame love for it and pardon grant to me. O my sweet Esperance, I mutely beg of thee, thy beauty high, the glory of thine eyes, the splendor of thy gentle customs born, thy chastity, of woman's worth the prize, the manners which thy every act adorn, have made him lord in such a subtle wise, to me and thee my mistress, though unsworn, that, saving death, no accident could part, the bonds that keep thy image closed within my heart, whatever I do, the image fair of thee, one only thought brings always to my heart, and every other speech expels from me, save speech of thee, for, though thou readless art, of how my soul thy handmaid seeks to be, a handmaid whom thy virtue may impart, something of gentleness, my lips do speak, always thy name, crying, O heart, peace, do not break, from these things, lady, springeth such a fire, as day and night my soul with torture weighs, and leaves no peace, wherever I may retire, my eyes weep tears, my breast its size doth raise, little by little I feel myself expire, from that great fire that in me flames always. Tis meet then that I flee to thy virtue, only to it if peace I'd ever have ensue. Thou only canst my grievous pains allay, put me in peace whenever it be thy will, thou only canst my sorrow do away, thou only with repose my heart canst fill, thou only canst my furious torment stay, with pious works of thine and make it still. And only thou, my sweet, canst satisfy the wish my heart will cherish evermore most high. Therefore, if ever any mortal wight, through either faith kept pure or love kept great, or service constant kept with all his might, in every case, in good or ill estate, hath grace deserved, regard me in such light, as one deserving me enumerate, lady, who come to thee as unto her who all my lofty passions, all my sighs doth stir. Well do I know I have not merited, through any service, that for which I play.
yet only thou for whom my heart hath bled. As for no woman else, canst show the way, to make me worthier in heart and head. O sweet my heart's desire, let go, I pray, thy high mind's high disdain, be kind to me. O thou whose every act bespeaks gentility, certain I am that, as thou provest fair, thou wilt prove piteous, and all my grief will change soon into joy most blithe and rare. Once thou wilt, lady, yield me sweet relief, ceasing to wish that I my pain should bear, and die for love of thee, tis my belief. My prayer is then, if aught avails my prayer, by that high love whose will keeps thee in precious care. At best I am a very meager prize, of little puissance, and of worth still less. But, sans fail, I am thine whatever arise. Be thou but shrewd, when I no more confess, thou'lt know no more to speak within me lies. Yet still I hope thy acts may still me bless, more than I earn and more than I deserve. May love to this high deed thy gentle heart preserve. Full many things remain for me to say, but lest I weary thee I'll keep them still, and to this end the fair Lord love I'll pray, that as he placed thee in my pleasure's will, so in thy wishes he may find a way, to place me too with thee, and thee so thrill, that as I now am thine the time may be, when thou becomest mine to be no more from me, and after all these words the prince had writ, Upon one page he folded it with care, then bathed his seal in strange and languorous fit, upon his tear-strewn cheeks to seal it there, then over a hundred times, still kissing it, he gave to Pandar's hands that letter rare, and did so crying, Letter, thou art blessed, destined in my fair lady's hand soon to be pressed. Pandaro then the pious letter took, and parting sought out Chrysa's abode, who, as she saw him come, her guests forsook, meeting him ere he over her threshold strode, and like an orient pearl then she did look, poised between wish and trembling in her mode. Each greeted other while they were afar, and then they clasped their hands as who most cordial are. A moment's pause, then Chrysaeus began. What business brings thee here? Is it tidings new? And to her Pandar's answer glibly ran, Lady, I have for thee good news and true but not for others' ears, as shouldst thou scan. These notes, they'll prove most quickly to thy view, for he who wrote them soon will die of woe, if thou'lt not soon on him some little love bestow. Take them, pursue them through with diligence, and soon, I ween, reply will make him glad. Chrysaeus paused in timorous reticence, nor took them yet, the while to color sad. Her face was changed, until with diffidence, she cried in plaintive note, O Pandar mad, desist, if love puts thee in quiet truth. Have some respect for me, not only for the youth, thyself be judge, consider thou and see. Ask thyself, dost thou ask a seemly thing? Can I do well to take immediately? Such letters as from Troil thou mayst bring, should ever a woman through dishonesty. Think to cure pains that in her lover spring. Leave not his letters here, I pray. For God's love, Pandar, Take them back, away, away. Pandaro, though disturbed, still urged his case. This is a matter ever strange in thought, that what they most desire all dames abase, and toward it ever each one feels she ought, beyond her sex, prove harsh in every place. So oft before this truth to thee I've brought, thou shouldst now be ashamed at hearing me. But still I do beseech thou'lt not deny my plea. A while Chrysaeus listened ere she smiled and took and placed his letter in her breast. When I have leisure, she then murmured mild, well as I can I'll scan what he's confessed, and if for doing so I am reviled, the blame must be that I have been oppressed. By thy ill power may God the cause observe, and for my simple heart some honest way preserve. Pandar the letter given took his leave, and Chrysaeus, to know what words it said, eagerly seized a time, one may believe, to leave her maids, and to her room she sped. There long she scanned the writing sans reprieve, and deep in pleasure, read it and reread, till she was where so much Troilo burned. It seemed in no act could his love be ever returned. Then dear became the thought to her, to know. Love had so sudden pierced his heart and soul, though that thought too was smit with living woe, so that she felt herself in nothing whole, and each word writ, when noted, moved her so. She praised and thanked love with an ample toll, urging within this fire to quench some way. 
Tis meet for me to find the hour, place, and day, for if I leave it in too great a flame, increasing it may hap incontinent. My face, discolored to the point of blame, may show the hid desire within me pent, which would be no small scar to my fair name. Myself to die I have no great intent, nor wish that others die when, with such joy, I can avoid my own and Troilo's annoy. Tis sure I shall not toward him be disposed, henceforth, as I have been until this hour. If Pandaro returns, he'll find composed. My answer, I'll smile and give it to his power, even if there be there with high cost imposed. Nor shall they say I pine within my bower, despised by Troilo, nay, his embrace. Would I felt now, drawn to him even face to face. Pandaro, oft of Troilo desired, at length returned to Cressays the fair, and smiling asked, Have aught thee yet inspired? The words which from my friend I late did bear, at once her face a crimson color fired. And God knows, she could only then declare, Yet Pandar urged the more, hast thou replied, Huerto so soon. She echoed tween her smiles and sighed, If ever I shall be free to act for thee. Pandaro pressed, grant that I be it now, and she to him, my way I cannot see, while he coaxed still, to please him think thou now, is not love wont to teach us well, party. I wish so much to comfort him, I vow, thou couldst not ever in faith my wish conceive. Without thou sent it once thy answer, I believe. I'll do it then to pleasure thee, she cried, and heaven grant the matter may chance well. It will fare thus, Pandaro Bleeth replied, so far as pleasing him it doth excel, and parted then, while Chrysaeus moved aside, and in a corner where it so befell, her maids had little custom to resort. She sat her down and wrote long words to this import, on thee, discreet and shrewdly potent friend, whom love for me so flagrantly beguiles, as now on one who to an undue end is seized with love for her, Chrysaeus smiles, and doth, her honor saved, now recommend her to thy valor which no sin defiles, bidding thee humbly hail to pleasure thee, if but my name be safe, and eke my chastity, from him who loves thee so he hath no care. For my pure honor, even for my fame, I've had thy letter in thy writing fair, reading wherein of thy life sad and lame, I sorrow as I read, by heaven I swear, and as my hopes of future bliss I frame, and though thy pages are all stained with tears, I have looked over them much, although with many fears, for pondering all things in my reason deep, thy sore affliction and thy mute request, seeing thy faith and how thy hope doth leap. I know not how I now may please thee best, or thy demand, and yet in safety keep, as I would ever, what I have I confessed, that mundane thing that most doth satisfy, my will to live full chaste and no less chaste to die, for me to pleasure thee were well enough. If ever the world were what the world should be, but, as it is, we may not use it rough, but must observe its views obediently, lest other deeds should bring us its rebuff, and other ills, yet pity grows for thee, and Malgrimi I'll have to grant it place, that thou may seem to gain more freely joy and grace, but such great worth I feel in thee resides. I know that thou wilt fully comprehend, what acts for me are meet, and that besides. Thou'lt be content whatever I extend. To thee in answer, what grief thee now bestrides. Thou'lt he curb thy grief that doth my heart offend, yet felt I not it was forbidden me. Most gladly I should do whatever might pleasure thee. Slight is the art, as thou full well canst see, and mean the writing in this letter wrote, which much I wish brought greater cheer to thee, but all it wills it cannot clear denote, although good will may give it potency, unless thou think it evilly doth quote, yet may it to thy pain some respite bring, even if it hath not made the fullest answering. For thine own offer here I make no place, for I am sure thou teep all faithfully, and I forsooth, poor as I am and base, more than a thousand times do promise me, to be thine own, if love doth not efface, with flame my very soul, which certainly, thou wilt not wish, no more, but God I pray. He may content thy wish and mine some happy day, and after she had writ him in such wise, she folded, sealed, and gave to Pandaro. That letter sweet, he, not delaying, hies, away with it in search of Troilo, and gives him it with joy and great surprise.
And, taking it, in haste that prince of woe, reads what was writ in Jin's to sigh anew, his heart a-quiver as her words appear to view. But, having well considered all she wrote, at last he mused, if right I understand, love binds her, but, as if of evil note, she seeks a shield to hide her from his hand, and shelter her from those great blows he smote. But that to do she cannot power command, for Venus makes me bear love and endure. And so must Chrysa's change to other talk for sure. To Pandar too, to whom the prince breathed all, the same seemed true, so, more than was his use, the youth takes comfort in his amorous thrall. For his chagrin no more he finds excuse, but hopes that presently the hour shall fall that will his pains reward with boons profuse, and this he begs and calls for day and night, as that which can alone his suffering requite. From day to day his ardor thence increased, and though hope helped him bravely to endure, in heart to feel most grave he never ceased, and that it grieved him much we can be sure, or from his fervor we may deem at least, he oft would dictate letters sweet and pure, to which her answers came now harsh, now mild, frequent or rare, however thrifty fortune smiled. Wherefore of Amor oft he would complain, or fortune too, whomever he deemed his foe. And many times, alas, he cried in pain, if Amor's nettle stung with less of woe, since it must pierce and grieve me thus again. Then could my life, of solace beggared, go, and seek out soon that sweet and gracious port, where first I shall arrive when death is my resort. Pandar, who felt how deep the amorous flame, burned in the breast of his beloved friend, with frequent courtesy to Chrysaes came, and frequent prayers, and told her to the end, all that she saw herself of Troil's fame, who yet, although she gladly ear would lend, opposed, do I not now already do, the things thou askest, brother, why then more pursue, they'll not suffice, Pandara made reply. I wish thou comfort him with fairer speech, and him Chryseis answered with a sigh, Myself to do his will I never can teach, for that I should my virtue's crown lay by. I'll never wish, through any cause thou preach, but like a brother for his goodness rare, I will him always love and for his honor fair. This crown, Panda replied, the priests will praise, in them from whom they cannot rob it ever. All men like saints their brows and speech may raise. But when the world's asleep, they little care. No one shall ever know Prince Trail's ways. Relieve his pain, to do him well but dare. They do great ill who can, but do no good. And they all waste their time who live in scornful mood. And Chrysaes said, I know his virtue well. That tender for my honor it will be. Nor will he ask if right his worth I spell. Other than do and honest things of me. And thee I by my safety swear and tell. That I am his for whom thou asks this fee, more now a thousand times than I am mine. So sweet I find his courtesies, so true and fine. If sweet they seem, what more then shouldst thou seek? I pray thee let all this thy shyness go. Wouldst thou he died for loving thee so meek? Dear thou must hold thy beauty, valued so. Thou slayest such a man for it. But speak, when wouldst thou that he come? Thou whom I know, he prizes more than heaven or God. How? Where? Think not to use with him thine every test and care. O oh, wretched me, where wilt thou lead me now, my Pandaro, and what more have me do? Thou hast despised and broke my chastest vow. To look thee in thy face I soon must rue. O oh, wretched me, twill never mend, I trow, and in my heart the blood will freeze anew. The while I think of that he asks of me, and thee it nothing grieves as thou dost clearly see. Would I had died upon that idle day. When in this logia first I hark to thee, thou madest my heart to yearn in such a way, I doubt if ever again it may be free, rather my honor thou to loss betray, and me, alack, to sighing endlessly, I can no more appeal, and thee to please. I will incline to do whatever shall give thee ease, but if before thy presence prayer may rise, I pray thee, gentle, precious kinsman mine, our acts and words be hid from all men's eyes, and secret kept, for sure the power is thine, to see what might ensue if, to surprise, such deeds should come to light. Give him this sign, bid him be sage, and, when the time draws nigh, I'll do whatever will his pleasure satisfy. And Pandar answer made, 
thy lips guard well, nor he nor I shall ever thee betray. And she, so mute thou hast me in thy spell, thou canst perceive what fear doth me affray, of what I hardly know, yet thee I tell. My honor and my shame no less today, touch thee than me, I'll pass from them in peace. And thou canst do with them whatever thee may please, and Pandar then, have thou no idle fear, lest we in this shall not good caution use. When wilt thou let the prince talk with thee here? Now let us draw the threads to our best we choose. To do it soon doth better far appear, since it must be done, for sure our little ruse. Is better hid, once ye in love have met, and both together planned what acts await you yet. Thou knowst, said Chryseis, what ladies dwell, and other servants in my house with me, a part of whom must go ere long, they tell, to attend the feet, then with him I will be. May this delay in him no grief compel, how he shall come, I'll show betimes to thee. Urge him to act in all things more than shrewd, and keep his hardihood well hidden and subdued. Canto 3, O sweet and fervent light, whose subtle ray, up to this point through fair love's beauteous hall, hath guided as I craved my poem's way. It now befits thy doubled beam, I call, to guide my genius and so give it sway. That in my verse may be declared all, no parcel missed, the good of love's sweet reign, which hath made Troilo a worthy man again. For every man can to this reign draw nigh, who will love's passion all entire endure, with knowledge, truth, and other virtues high. But to arrive no other way is sure, whoever attempt. Therefore, I pray, be by, O lady fair, my wishes high and pure, fill with thy grace whatever I demand and bravely I will sing thy praise on every hand. To Troil, though his ardor still burned keen, it seemed his fortune showed itself more fair. He only knew Chryseis, pleased, had seen, and answered with a sweet and lowly air. What letters he had written her, I ween, and often as he saw that lady rare, she looked on him with face so soft and bright, he knew he felt in him the most supreme delight. Pandar had gone, as elsewhere I have told, leaving the prince's lady to her peace and glad at heart and of his face quite bold, he sought the youth he'd left so ill at ease, between fair hope and sad plaints manifold, when he had gone fair Chryseis to appease. And seeking for a time now here now there, he found him in a temple thinking, and in prayer, soon as he came upon him thus in thought, he drew him thence apart and gan to say, My friend so deep with pain my heart was fraught, what time I saw thee languishing away, so cruelly for love on me was brought, no small part of thy sorrow that sad day. To seek thee comfort I have never ceased, since then, even though I have not found thy woe decreased. For thee I have become a go-between, for thee mine honor clear I've cast away. For thee my sister's breast, that late was clean, I've made corrupt till in her heart doth play. Deep place to love for thee and her I ween, ere time grows long thou'lt see as fair as day with greater plaisance than thou hearst me speak. Thou'lt have thy Chryseis in thy arms, full meek, but as God knows, who all things yet doth see. And thou thyself, it was a hope full poor, first sped my efforts and my loyalty, alone, to thee, my friend, made them endure. Till by my toil the prize I'd won for thee. So now, if of thy wished boon thou'dst make sure, nor have base fortune catch it quick away, in all thy love schemes show thee wise, my prince, I pray. Thou knowst through Troy town Chryseis' repute, is yet most fair and sacred, not a deed, of else than good do men to her impute. And, now thou hast her in thy hands, take heed, for thou canst take whatever thee may suit. Yet if her name she lose, twere evil speed, and more than shame to me, her kith and kin. Whoever more should guard lest villain's name I win. Therefore I pray thee now as I can best, that, tween ourselves, we keep this business still. From Chrysaea's heart I have, with happy hest, removed all modest fear and every will. That checked at thee, and hold it now so stressed, with speaking of thy true love's fill, that quite she loves thee and inclines to do, whatever it may please thee to command her to. Yet but a little time before success, thou shalt enjoy complete, and I shall place her in thine arms for thy delight to bless, but, for God, act with such a quiet grace, that naught escapes thy heart through carelessness. O oh, dear, my friend, 
despise not my dull face. If many times I make my prayer to thee, seeing that what I beg is begged in honesty. Oh, who could tell in verse the joy complete, which trails soul now hearing Pandar knew, or how, receding far, its pain did fleet, the more he spake away from every view. The sighs that he had breathed to riches sweet, yielded their place most gently, caitiff rue, departed, and his lately tearful face. Bright new hope did reveal with signs of joyous grace. And, as it chances in the newborn spring, that trees and shrubs and leaves and blossoms new, smile at the robes the sudden hours bring, to hide their limbs late nude to wintry view, as meadows, hills, and eke the rivers too, smile clothed in green and every flower's hue. So with a newer joy, twas easy seen. Troilo smiled and laughed now with a face serene, and softly in sweet rapture first he sighed, gazing in glad content at Pandar's face. Ah, how thou must remember, then he cried, the tears thou found'st me in my bitter case, when still me thought it best my love to hide. Ah, how thou must recall that time and place, where thy demands and urgent wish to know, forced from my woeful breast the reason of my woe. Aware, then, how I tried to keep it hid, even from thee my only friend, although, to tell it thee no peril did forbid, save that I seemed immodest doing so. Think how, when I consent, as late I did, to tell it, think how I dread lest others know. Forget not how I fear lest men suspect. God keep that misadventure from poor me deject, but nay the less, by highest Jove I swear. The God who heaven and earth rules equally, that if in Agamemnon's hands to fare, prove not my evil chance I swear at thee, that were my life not mortal but more rare, eternal even, thou canst assert be. Thy trust with all my power will be preserved, and she who wounds my heart full honestly be served. Full well I wot all thou hast said and done, and all thy grace to me I see it clear, and that no act of mine, however begun, or rendered, could repay thee mine arrear. For out of hell and worse to heaven I'm won, and drawn by thee, so by our friendship near. I beg, take not the villain's name to thee, but rather think thou servest friend's necessity, the name of villain let those wretches claim, whom love of gold doth spur to villainy. What thou hast done thou didst sans any blame. To draw me from my bitter plaints I see, and from those hostile thoughts that ever came, to fight and scatter all sweet peace in me. Just as, tis meet that for a friend one do, when one beholds his fellow overcome with rue, and that thou mayest fully realize, the gracious thanks I'd like to yield thee now. Know that I have a sister, beauty's prize, Polyxena, whose charms are praised, I vow, scarce less than those of Helen in a wise. Open thy heart, seek love of her somehow, or even of Helen, my own brother's wife, and, thee to win thy choice, I'll work with all my life. But since thou hast achieved me so much more, then I could beg of thee, see to the end. My sweet desire, when time fits, I implore. To thee I have recourse. All can depend. Only on thee, in thee my joys and more, my comfort, solace, health, delight, do blend. Yet an thou bid it not, I'll do no deed. Be my delight, and thence thou'lt see thy joy proceed. Pandar by Troil's word was satisfied, and both resumed their ordinary care. But in each day now Troilo espied, a hundred days, with her so ill aware, and suffering in them all could scarce abide, those flames of love which all in him did tear. So gave to thoughts of love the hours of night, and with his comrades spent the day in martial fight, with matters thus, the time so much desired. Of those two lovers neared, whence Cresses made, to summon Pandar and it so transpired, she showed him all her wish. But Pandar played, grieving that Troilo that day was hired, with others for some special martial raid, or deed of war was far away from cry, although twas very like he'd come back by and by. This news, the while she heard, proved grief to her, and sad she turned, but with most friendly zeal. Pandar declared he'd find some messenger, to send the prince, she need make no appeal. And thereupon, with but the briefest stir, nor any let the man had proved him leal, and Trail found, who listened with surprise, then hurried back to Troy in blithe and joyous wise, and come to Pandaro from him he learned in full the needful steps that he must take, 
and now impatiently the young prince burned, awaiting night that ever seemed to break. In flight before his gaze, quiet he turned, and took his way with Pandaro his make, for that sweet spot where lovely Crassis stood, lonely expectant, with fear and subtle dread subdued. At length the night fell clouded and obscure, as Troil wished who, gazing full intent, examined all to be the more secure. The while he moved, in hope that no event should make his eager love new pain endure, or cheat it now when from its great torment it seemed it should escape, and soon, alone, secret, he entered Chrysae's house, now quiet grown, and in a secret, safe removed place, as had been him instructed, stayed in wait, nor seemed his waiting now an evil grace, nor failing yet to see clear, harsh in fate, but often with a sure, courageous face. He urged within, my love, ere very late, will come to me, and I'll be happier then, than were I, all alone, the lord of earth and men, Chrysais, who his coming well had heard, that he might now the better understand, how twas arranged, coughed once, and no more stirred. Then, lest his waiting wearily expand, she gan to speak, with oft a quickened word, till all her maids she'd hastened, well she planned, off to their beds, declaring that such sleep, had never fallen on her, awake she could not keep. After that each and all had gone to rest, and the whole house grown quiet everywhere. To Lady Crusades it did first seem best, toward Troil's hiding place in haste to fare, who, as he heard her footsteps thither pressed, rose up and, starting towered her, passed from there, with joyful face and mute expectancy, to be prepared for all the lady might decree, and now, a lighted torch within her hand, the lady quite alone came down the stair, and found the prince with all his ardor fanned, awaiting her, whom with full courteous air, she greeted as she could, my lord, command, if aught I did offend thee, hidden there, and thy high royal love in any way, or, sweet my love, for God's sake grant me pardon, pray, and her her troil answered, lady bright, sole hope and good and blessing of my heart, thy face hath so long been before my sight, a lucent star, so splendid in each part, and each dear ray of it such glorious light, that all my palace seems of poorer art, and to ask pardon more is mine than thine. Then he embraced her, and they kissed in rapture fine, and now, ere they could part from that charmed place, with dalliance sweet and eager joyous play, they clasped their arms in many a glad embrace, a thousand times they kissed in amorous way, for in them fire burned of an equal pace, and each the other felt was dear as day. But, when their greetings ended at the last, they climbed the stairs and to an inner chamber passed. Long would it need to tell now of their bliss, and no man could express that rich delight. They had together when they entered this, free for sweet nuptials and sans hindrance quite, save that at Trail's side fair Chrysace, trembled a moment and must cry in fright. Troil, lord and love, when brides are new, they are abashed to meet, the first night, lovers view. To whom the prince then, sweet, O oh, sweet, my soul, yield that my arms do now thee closelier take, and have, as Lord love wills, more perfect toll of love, and she, behold, for thy sweet sake, I rid me of all fear and seek my goal, in thine arms only, then courteously her make, drew her more close and close in his embrace, that they might win of love more high and richer grace, O oh, sweet, most sweet, and most discerned knight. How lavish wert thou to those lovers gay, if all the knowledge were made mine of right, which all the poets owned I could not say, nor truly yet explain their joyance bright, but he who knows the favor of love's way, and boons hath had of him, can guess or know, in part at least the joy that love to these did show. And all night long from one another's arms, they stirred not, nor released their sweet embrace, yet still believed in one another's arms, it could not quite be real, their sweet embrace. They could not be in one another's arms, but only dreamed they were in sweet embrace. And each the other asked with frequent care, Is mine a true embrace, or dream, or art thou there? And so they gazed with such enraptured will, that neither could from other turn his eyes, but each the other cried with voice athril, My love, is it true I'm with thee in this wise? And yes, heart of my heart, 
each answered still. And God have thanks for it, in amorous sighs. And then each drew the other in embrace, and sweetly kissed again the other's lovely face, and oft upon her eyes, for love aglow. Troil would press a soft, enraptured kiss, crying, My heart ye have inflamed so, with love's sweet darts that burning now seems bliss, and caught, I cannot hide nor find it woe, nor flee, as those are wont who fare amiss. Ye hold, and ever may hold, mine eyes in me, meshed in the net of love's own sweet intricacy. A second time he kissed them, and once more, till in response the lady kissed his eyes, then he over all her face and breast did kisses pour, and no hour passed without a thousand sighs. Not those that come from souls with anguish sore, but out of reverent souls which prove them wise, showing thereby the love that's in the breast, then sighing over themselves to joy they knew addressed. Such scenes should make the caitiff misers pause, who so themselves have given all to gold. Accounting pence they reckon love but cause, for scorn and laughter and him who loves too bold. Let them but ponder if by any laws they can from all their wealth such pleasure hold in any single point, as love doth give, to those who joined for his grand venture love and live. Tis like they'll say they can and willing lie, calling with many a wanton mock and jest. Love is a wretched folly best passed by, without once seeing that, by fate's behest, a single hour may come their souls to try, and they, their gold lost, live thence never blessed, by joy in life or love. God make them sad, and give to lovers all the wealth they might have had. But these two lovers, feeling comforted, began together hopefully to speak, telling each other of their pains now fled, their plaints, their sighs, their anguish cruel, bleak, and oft, when such speech had been wholly said, again they would more fervent kisses seek. And now, forgetting all their past annoy, they took together thus a most delirious joy. So here I have no tale to tell of sleep for theirs was all desire the night should last. Such pleasure did they from their waking reap. They could not say to each other while it passed, and all they did and said they thought to keep, through such an act of waking, long and fast. And not to let their fair chance lapse in vain, they made full use of it all night in glad refrain. But, as the cocks gan crow and day drew nigh, and in the east the purple dawn arose, their will to embrace again once more burned high. And in that hour they felt were dolorous woes, which made them part, and in it pain did lie. Of such a kind none yet had known its throes, to torture them so hard and would be to part. While love flamed more than ever in each eager heart, and, hearing them thus all too early crow, fair Chrysaes called out sad, O love of mine. Now tis ordained we rise by fate, our foe, would we keep hidden well our love's design. But yet I wish once more before thou go, to kiss thy lips, to say that I am thine, with one more kiss that after thou art sped. My pain, O sweet my life, may feel diminished. Prince Troilo embraced her weeping thus, and drawn within his arms, her kissed again, cursing the day which came so envious, and, churlish, made them part so early then. And after he began in words as dolorous, Lady, unmeasured grief comes off to men but parting from thee brings even greater woe, since every joy I feel, that joy to thee I owe. I know not how I can do else than stay, for thought of how much going thwarts my will, and that, now I have taken life's pain away, pale death over me its power holdeth still, nor if I may return, nor when I may. O fate, why hast thou such a pleasured thrill? In taking me from there where most I joy, why wilt thou now my solace and my peace destroy? Alack, what shall I do, if now desire, when first we part, constrains me to return, till life can hardly bear it, O pain most dire? And why, O hateful day, dost thou so yearn, and come so soon our parting to require? How soon will it be that once again I learn? Thou art restored, alack I cannot know. Then, turning back, he kissed fair Chrysia's face in woe, saying, O lady mine, if I believed that in thy heart my image were to stay, so sure as thine will rest in mine received. More dear t'would be to give Troy's rule away, than lose thy love, and less I should feel grieved, at parting thus, which gainst my will doth sway, and hope that time and place might come again,
for us to soothe as now our cruel fire and pain. And sighing, him fair Chrysase answered then, while closelier she her arms about him cast. Have done thy talk, my soul, for oft mid men. I've heard it said, if well my memory last, love's greedy spirit doth never release again, what once it has caught, but holds it hard and fast, and pressed and closed in its embrace so tight, that counsel to release it hath then no power or might, and through thee love hath grown so whole in me, O oh dear my precious lord, that if I sought, loveless, as I was late, again to be, I could not even wrest thee from my thought, morning and evening, always shall I see, thy image in my heart entirely wrought, and, could I think myself so wholly thine, I should more blessed feel than knowledge can define, then live thou therefore of my love secure, which never for other have I felt so great, if to return thou wish with fervor pure, I too desire it more than thou canst state, and happy hour will not be mine, I'm sure. Ere thou return, return thou soon or late. Heart of my body, I commend me thee. She spake and sighed and kissed her prince most tenderly, and Troil, all against his will, arose, when now the hundredth time he'd kissed her face. For then, like one who well his devoir knows, he fought not fate but clad himself with grace, and then a thousand pledges did propose. I'll do thy will nor break it in no case, thy promise keep. I yield thee to God's care, and mine own spirit, lady, to thy keeping rare. But Chrysaeus had no voice to answer more, so fast pain for his parting her had caught, and Troil with swift step as never before, turned toward his house, now happy in his thought, knowing in love was even greater store, to kindle love than ever his will had sought. So much more he had found in Chrysaeus, than he erewhile had dreamed could ever be in bliss. And, to his royal palace now returned, the prince betook him quietly to bed, to seek somehow the sleep he late had spurned, but sleep refused to enter heart or head, so restless in him now his new thoughts burned, recalling his delight so lately sped, thinking how great was his fair Chrysae's worth, so all incredible it hardly seemed of earth, and now her every act in reverie, he turned, and all her sweet, wise speech, repeating to himself still happily, the pleasance that her every word did teach, and love of her he even felt would be, greater than he could image or beseech. But with such thoughts the more he was consumed, the less he knew love's flame was in his heart illumed. And Chrysaeus at her home did quite the same, reasoning of Troil in her woman's heart, speaking great praises of fair Amor's name, that such a lover proved in every part. He'd given her, and then she gan to blame. The thousand years it seemed that must depart, ere she that lover once more could embrace, and as the night before could kiss him face to face. Then, ere the morn was sped, came Pandaro, to Troil Rissen, accosting him with glee, and fair was greeted by Prince Troilo, who cast him on his neck quite joyfully. My Pandar, none is welcome whom I know, as thou, and on his brow in amity. He kissed his friend, thou'st won me heaven for hell, and if I be not slain now, all will be most well and I could never do as much for thee. Were I to die a thousand times a day, it would not even then an atom be. Of that I know is owed thee every way. From bitter plaint thou'st brought me joy today. Once more he kissed him, and then added he, O sweet my love who makest me content, when shall I hold thee more as Amor hath it meant? The sun, which all the world each day doth view, sees never a lady blithe or fair as she. If to my words now any faith is due, as sweetly clad or sold as graciously, and service to her none could ever rue, or, in her hire, live else than joyously. O praised be love, who now hath made her mine, and thy good service, Pandar, friend so true and fine, for thou no little grace hast shown to me, and given me to no slight joyousness. My life must ever be in debt to thee, and thou mayst claim it always in redress. From death to life thou hast delivered me. He ceased and gladly mused in quietness, while Pandar, who had heard, stood waiting still, and then to his words answered with a joyful will, If I in any slightest thing, my friend, have pleased thee well, I am enough content. It proves on me sweet favors do attend. But yet, that thou now curb thy love's intent, and guide it well, I must thee warning lend. Be thou most sage, lest cruel, harsh torment. Do rest thy love away, and all thy joy, or, 
for thy prating, turn it into a sad annoy. I'll gladly do whatever may thee please, Troilo to his friend made fair reply, and then recounted at his greater ease what late had happened him of pleasures high. Continuing, I say, to love's decrees, hath never bowed a man so much as I. His ancient fire burns me in every place, drawn from fair Chrysase's peerless eyes and face. I burn now more than ever, but yet this flame, which thus I feel anew, hath quality, other than that of yore and jocund and game. It doth renew in all the heart of me, for thought of Chrysase's charms and beauteous name. And true, it is that now more eagerly, than I was wont, I yearn for her embrace. I'd kiss a thousand times her sweet and lovely face. Nor could the youth now feel him satisfied, but prattled on to pander of the good. He late had known, and all his joy beside, of comfort sweet that had all pain withstood, of perfect love that now no scorn belied, which he for Christ's says felt and ever would. In whom was all his hope, he glad announced, for whom all other wishes he had late renounced. Some time elapsed, then fortune, proving fair for Trail's love gave opportunity. And straight, as soon as night was in the air, he slipped forth from his palace hastily. Glad no star showed itself in radiance there, and on the wanted way sped quietly. To his sweet love, and in her house he strode, to his accustomed place and quiet there abode. And Chrysais, as the other time she came. So this time to her love she came again, and in her manner did all things the same, and glad they bade each other greeting then, as lovers should if they would have no blame, and after hand in hand with joy amain. They got them to fair Chryseis's chamber sweet, and there at once reclined for kissing as was meet, and when she held him there in her embrace, full blithe and joyous gan she then to speak, knows or knew ever any dame such grace, as I enjoy, or could such favor seek, what woman would refuse with quiet face? to die at her own hands with spirit meek, if she might gain thereby a joy like mine. No, for one single moment a rapture so divine. Ah, sweet my love, went Chrysaeus on to say, I do not know how I shall ever tell. The joy and glad desire made mine today, for that I have thee in my heart so well, where I shall always wish to have thee stay. As true as late thy image there did dwell, and of Jove nothing else I would require than that thou always have within a like desire, that Jove himself could ever check this flame. I cannot think, although I did believe, when last we met he might attempt that game. But evil was the guess I did conceive, for thou pourst fevered water on the same, so that it burns still more thou canst perceive. Whence now I love as never I loved before, and day and night I do desire thee more and more, and Troil answered not far otherwise, as still the two in sweet embraces clung, and prattled there thus in their lover's guise, choosing such words as on their lips are hung, who best know what delight within them lies. The while he kissed the eyes he late had sung, her lips and throat, and each did other greet, in words which, written out, proved them not half so sweet. But then once more the envious day drew near, as might through many an open sign be seen, and him as cruel they cursed, for twas most clear far earlier than his use had ever been. He chose, they vowed, on that morn to appear, aggrieved he should himself now so demean. But, when their curses proved quite powerless, both got them up in haste, since there was no redress. Then each the other bade a fond farewell. As they were wont, and after many sighs, they vowed that, ere the glass should many hours tell. Each should once more look in the other's eyes, and, as they could, in others' arms dispel. The tortures which imparted lovers rise, and practice all love's gifts to joyous youth, while they continued in such safety, in good sooth, and Troilo now lived in mighty bliss, singing his lady's charms as in a dream, feeling he should himself prove all remiss, should he another lady's face esteem, and that all other men lived but amiss, who loved not such a one, it him did seem. So matchless did his lady now appear, such fair fortune the thought of her drew near. And often he would seize Pandaro's hand, and oft his fellow to some garden lead, where deep absorbed in thought of her he'd stand, or praise his lady's worth and courteous reedy, till joy, it seemed, did so his soul command. It must disown all melancholic breed, 
and he would sing such songs in joyous wise, as scarce a poet could by any means devise. O light turn, whose glad and splendid rays make even the third heaven fairer still and bright, whence pleasures flow and love and pious praise, daughter of Jove, beloved of Phoebus white, lady benign in all thy heart's sweet ways. Tis thou for sure that givest me will and might to sing my happiness in such sweet sighs. Be praised forever hence thy puissance most wise. The sky, the earth, the sea, and even hell, each feels in it thy subtle potency. O glorious light, and if the truth I tell, plants, seeds, and herbs feel it too as equally. Birds, beasts, and fish to its eternal spell subject themselves if fair the season be. Men too, and gods, no creatures can endure, unless still in the world is felt thy presence sure. Twas thou, O goddess fair, Jove first did stir, those high effects to try and to achieve, through which all things that are, occur, and often yet, when mortals deeds him grieve, thou dost him sue that we may not incur, deserved woe but joy instead receive, thou in a thousand forms hadst thy behest, when of him thou didst make now this or that request, thou fiery Mars to thy sweet pleasant will, dost render humble and dispel his ire. Base thought thou dost despise, and him dost fill, who sighs for thee with lofty pride and fire. And through thy sovereignty thou grantest still, who merits them the fruits of his desire. Gentle and courteous thou makest all, who gladly let thy fire and flame upon them fall. Thou keepest, goddess fair, in unity, the lots of men, their realms and provinces. Through all the world, all friendships spring from thee and all their fruits in sooth and essences. Thou only know'st the secret quality of everything that now created is, and so thou dost perform that men admire, even though they cannot look on thy most potent fire. Thou settest laws for the wide universe, through which it can its being firm maintain. And to thy son no white can be adverse, for all who lean on him themselves sustain. And I, who with my prate was late perverse, and towered him rude, do now confess it plain. I am, as it befits, enamored now, as never I could express by any word or vow. For this, if any man me reprehend, it irks me not. He knows not what he says. Valiantly Hercules will me defend, for he himself could not escape love's ways, and in his wisdom still doth them commend. And whoever hides him not neath shame's black rays, that man will not hold me in great disdain. For love, which Hercules even found was noble gain. Tis thence I love and mid thy benefits. I follow that that pleasures me the more, in which all great delight and joy on sits, when rightly my heart craves love's goodly store. Yea, that love pleases most and most befits, which in sweet beauty goes all things before. In such high love, Chrysaes pursue, in whom such virtued, holy excellence I view. Tis this, that in me now such joy doth raise, and always will, if that I keep me wise. Tis this, O goddess, makes me so to praise, all loose and virtue that within thee lies, for which, I heaven thank, no arms have ways, to wrest me from thy clear-lit face and eyes, in which I saw thy virtue pictured so, that all thy lucid puissance glistened there aglow. I bless the time, the year, the month, the day, nay more that very hour and moment I would bless, when Chastis Chrysaes, fair and blithe and gay, first showed my eyes her witching beauteousness, nor yet to bless thy son would I delay, whose grace to me in virtue is no less, kindling my love to her as servant true, putting my peace in those her eyes so fair to view, and blessed I would call those fervent sighs, which for her sake I have driven from my breast, and blessed too the tortures and the cries, which made me find through love love's perfect rest while to those sweet desires drawn from her eyes, more fair than others, should be praise addressed. And unto thee my highest thanks I lift, because thou shewest me so high and blessed a gift, but higher yet great Jove I would extol, who to the world gave such a lady dear. And unto me, in darkness sunken all, the light to see her radiant shining here, until in her, from whom high wish might call, I felt inflamed and saw my joy draw near. Such favors never yet have gods bestowed on man from whom they are in sooth more truly owed. Had I a hundred tongues and could each speak, 
and had I in my breast a poet's power. All thy and all their knowledge were too weak ever to express her virtue's lofty dower, her courtesy or yet her pleasance meek. Whoever can portray them at this hour, I pray he now his subtle craft shall lend, and make me know it better to a noble end. And thou, O goddess, canst such craft confer, if thou but wish, and much I crave it thee. To thee what greater happiness could now occur, than so disposing all my hours for me, that all of them be spent to pleasure her. Grant me, O goddess, such a boon to see, me who was gathered once in thy embrace, and after, taken thence not knowing thy true grace. Follow who will now wealth or mighty reign, war or adventure, hunting, falconry, Diana's pastimes, Mars' prodigious pain. Henceforth my gaze on Chrysas' eyes shall be, and all my time I shall hereafter train, to keep it on their beauty constantly. For as I gaze they raise me Jove above, so much they fill my heart with boundless, priceless love. I have not worthy thanks to offer thee. O goddess fair, O fair eternal light, and muteness even now so oppresses me. I cannot speak, but then, my lady bright, accept the thanks I wish thee honestly. Prolong, conceal, correct, and govern right. Mine ardor now, and hers whom I adore. Let not our loves be changelings hence forevermore. Then did this troil in each chance of war. Prove him first chief in arms in every deed, and he upon the Greek so fiercely bore, so bold and brave, if true's the tale I read, they were afraid by him as never before, by any man, for now, twas love did feed, with courage high his lofty spirit proud, great love, whose servitor he had him late avowed, or he would go to hunt in times of truce, with falcon, gerfalcon, or eagle even, in hand, and oftentimes, it was with dogs his use. To chase great bears, boars, lions through the land, for smaller game he spurned and did refuse, and at such times he would for joy expand, if Chrysais he saw as blithe and free, as falcon from a hood new set at liberty. And then of love his speech was all entire, of gracious mien and full of courtesy, to praise all honest men was his desire, and from all caitiffs still to keep him free and whatever youths excelled in youthful fire, adorned with honors, twas his will to see, but them that loved not, much he held in scorn, lost souls, whose villain state was hardly to be borne. And though of royal blood was this our knight, and though at will he might in much command, humble he made himself as any white, as modest as the lowliest in the land, for so love willed in whom dwells subtle might, to make men more for others' pleasure stand. Pride, envy, avarice he held in ire, and from all taint of these he made himself retire. But such great joy could last but little space, thanks to Dame Fortune, cruel and envious, who in this world leaves nothing firm in place. For some new chance, and oft it cometh thus. She turned from Troilo her cruel face, and all the joy he felt so copious, the fruits of Chryseas's love, she tore away and for them did him but a bitter grief repay. Canto four, Since that the Greeks still held in mighty siege, the Trojan town, Prince Hector, in whose hand, was all the war sought out from Trojans Liege, and from the bravest allies in the land, and picked a group for valor's privilege, and with them in the open fields took stand, against the Greeks, as oft before he'd done, and all the varied chance of melee they did run. The Greeks advanced and square the encounter met, and all that day in battle hard they spent, until the Trojan knights, too sore beset, their sally failing, when occasion lent, turned them to flight, as loss and travail let. But in that fight by death were many hent, and others still were taken prisoner then, famed kings, great lords, and numerous noble valiant men. Mongst these were that great hero, Antenor, Polydamas his son, and Menestius, Xantippus, Sarpedon, Polynestor, Polytes too, and Trojankine Ryphius, and others whom to save the brave Hector. Tried all his might, but twas to little use. Retreat was forced, and plaints filled all of Troy. Though auguries foretold a greater yet annoy, King Priam asked a truce, and twas declared. Whereat for the exchange they gan to treat. Ransoms of heavy gold were now prepared. Man or a gift should buy man from defeat. Soon then, as Calchas saw how matters fared, he changed his face, and mid the Greeks' full fleet, he got 
roaring his plaints, and howled until he had obtained that they would listen to his will. Trojan I was, my lords, the seer began, as all of you methinks are full aware, and if you will recall, I am the man who first brought hope unto your thirst and care, and said when to its end the season ran, and the due hour came, then should your trumpets blare. The victory you had won for high emprise, when Troy should burn and fall before your watching eyes, the order and the means thereof you know, and hold from me as I did demonstrate. But though all your desires in time proved so, and at the looked-for hour as I did state, still in no word of mine your faith you'd show. If taken from sealed or open book of late, however much it seemed my coming here, was willed to give you counsel and provide new cheer, and since fate wished it so, t'was fortunate that I by my own skill should find the way to escape the town so keep the secret great, that none should know a word of it to say, and bring me here alone, when day was late, and clear sky turning light to brown and gray. For come I have and hither with me brought, of all the things I owned, no greater thing than naught, but for my leaving all I nothing care, save for that only daughter young and frail, whom I left back, O parent sans compare, for cruelty, his offspring so to fail. Would God I'd led her safe from there, but fear and fury made my courage pale. That is my cause of grief for leaving Troy, tis that hath robbed from me all of my cheer and joy. Long days I've made myself in silence wait, seeing no time when I could make demands of you to ransom her but now, though late, I come to ask this favor of your hands, and if you cannot give it, if tis my fate, I never shall see her more, more these lands. I'll wander never again, my life I'll scorn, careless to live or die in all things then forlorn. Here in your camp is many a Trojan peer, barren and lesser man ye would exchange, for captured Greeks the Trojans hold in fear. To give me one you could with ease arrange, and for the price of him, a price not dear, Chrysae's ransom. Oh, thus I beg is strange, from grief for God's sweet sake a wretched wight, grown old and of all solace void and empty quite, and let no wish by heaven I conjure you. For great wealth gained through ransoms of these lords, delay you now when tis most certain true, that all Troy's strength and all Troy's richest hordes are in your hands, and if I err not too, the might of him whose courage yet affords, to keep Troy locked against your wish, will fail, and Hector soon, methinks, in violent death fall pale. And as he spoke these words, the ancient priest, humble in speech and with a face downcast, watered his cheeks with tears most free released, over his hoary beard and breast they passed, in doing all, and never his prayers he ceased, until their piteousness gained ears at last, for, when they heard the Greeks began to shrill, send Antenor to Troy, let Calchas have his will. Such compact made they, Calchas felt content, and envoys for the task they soon had chose. These came to Priam, told why they were sent, and to his sons and lords made honest shows, till Troy's grave king had called a parliament. The thing to weigh, and answer brief was lent. If Greeks to Trojans firm their pledge will hold, Trojans will hand to Greeks what prisoners they are. Troyal stood near at that great conference, and heard the Greeks for Chrysaeus make request. Sudden his heart was pierced without defense, then sorrows quickened thrust him sore oppressed and on his soul grief fell so stern and tense, he felt he must die, sitting there distressed. Only with labor did he keep confined. As it behooved the love and sad complainings in his mind, then he grew full of anguish and proud fear, and he began to wait the dread reply. Unwanted was the care fell on him here. The while he pondered what was best and why, whether his secret to his brother's ear. He dared entrust when fortune ill was nigh if Chrysaes were to Calchas rendered now. How he might hinder that by any deed or vow, on one hand came then love, that made him feel, ready to offer him gainst any fate, while on the other reasons stern repeal, gave such proud high emprise a doubtful rate, for might not Chrysaes, the thought was real, be brought thereby to fears most desolate? So will he, nil he, in his tristful woe, between two fires he stood, the fearful Damoiseau, and while he brooded in such doleful wise, yet all suspense the baron still conferred, discussing much whatever did arise, what most was needful for what had occurred, 
and when they spake, it was with no surprise. To him who waited for their answering word, Chrysais should be given incontinent. She never had been in any durance held or pent, as a field lily then by plowshare caught, and notched, falls low beneath the intense sun, and fades, its late rich color changed to naught, and paleness covering all, so pallor won, when into words their counsel full was wrought, and Greek and Trojan pledges had begun, till Troil swooned away, struck low by grief, for peril boundless quite, and lost sands all relief. Then him old Priam seized in quick embrace, and Hector and his brothers too for fear. Now moved them all lest worse should prove his case. Each sought to succor him to death so near. One rubbed his pulse, another bathed his face. And each a prudent wight with love sincere. Labored to call his spirit back again. Though for some little time it naught availed their pain, he lay among his kindred vanquished quite, and little breath was left in his pale frame. His face showed lifeless, tinged a death-like white, like dead he seemed, and living but in name. Such sorry guise was his in that sad plight. None saw that wept not for the pain that came, for all too cruel was that lofty tone. He heard, when, t'was declared the Greeks should Chrysae's own, a long time did his stricken spirit stray, in darkness lost ere it recovered all, then, coming back, returned in quiet way, whence he, like one who waked at sudden call, rose sudden to his feet in deep dismay, a moment dazed, then, ere white, could fall, on him and ask what pain t'was hurt him so. He feigned some cause, and scaped with his new bitter woe, and towered his palace quickly, then he sped, without appeal or sign to any wight. So deep on sighs and sorrows had he fed, he wished no comrade in his dismal plight, and, come unto his room, Prince Troil said. He so lacked sleep that now of every night. He must needs be excused. His servants, too, might leave. Closing the windows first, he would not light perceive. To witness what then followed, Lady Fair, I cannot wish at all that thou be near. And yet my soul must know such heavy care, as fills both memory and mind with fear. Though of itself oppressed, twill little dare, for so my parting from thee keeps it drear. One jot to tell, unless thou give it aid. Thou who hast caused the wound by which tis still afraid, to this time blithely have I sung in joy. All the rich favor love gave Troilo, and what was mingled in it of annoy. Now I must turn from joy to somber woe, and even though thou like not mine employ, I cannot yet refrain perforce I know. Thy heart will change and with new pity view, mine own life given up so whole to grief and rue. But if my wishes ever reach thine ears, I pray thee by the love I bear to thee. Give respite to my grievous woes and fears, and so restore my wonted joy to me, which at our parting turned itself to tears. Yea, if my death thou'dst bear aught heavily, return thou soon, for it is cherished naught, the life thou leftest me when parting pleased thy thought. Prince Troil in his chamber barred and dark, stayed desolate without that any man, suspected aught sans fear that men could hark, and there the grief that in his breast now ran and made, through misadventure, such sad mark. To give release the caitiff then began, opening his heart in such a crazed way, he seemed not man but frenzied beast, thou wouldst say. Not otherwise a bull which mortal blow hath had goes leaping madly here and there, and, by his wretched roaring makes all know what torture tis hath fallen in his lair. So Troil struck now, in his mighty woe, his head against the wall with wild despair. He beat his face and breast most piteously, writhing his arms and hands in bitter agony. His eyes shed tears for pity of his heart, in copious weeping till they almost seemed. Two fountains whence abundant waters start, deep sobs and sad complainings in him teemed, and vain words did him from his courage part. Words that, because the past had been misdreamed, went wild about, demanding naught but death, scorning and cursing all gods, fate and mortal breath. But this his frenzy slowly yielded place, as length of time did soothe his bitter plaint. When once more on his bed he hid his face, the flame of grief still burning sans restraint, and then, ere time could many moments trace, arose to weep and sigh like zealous saint, because one head and breast could never bear the pain he wished to heap them with in his despair. Anon he gan to cry with weeping new, 
O fortune, fickle, unshamed, cursed white, what evil have I done thee in thy view, that thou oppose whatever gives me delight? Hast thou no joy, sands, causing me more rue? Why dost thou turn thy wrong face to my sight, thy favor from me, who have loved thee more, as cruel thou knowst and held thee every god before? If with my carefree life so blessed in joy, thou wert displeased, why sought'st thou not in hate, to bring to earth the lofty pride of Troy, to make me by my sire's death desolate, or bring on Hector some most cruel annoy, on him in whom our hope rests all of late? Why robbedst thou not Polyxena of life, or Paris even, or Helen his fair Spartan wife, if Chrysaes were only left to me, and all else lost, I'd gain in having her, and never repine at other penury. Yet always thy fell darts themselves bestear, to prey on things that stir thy jealousy, to show thee fickle thou dost I prefer, to take away my joy gives thee delight, I would that thou had slain me ere I knew this plight. Alas, O love, O sweet and pleasant Lord, who knowest all that in the world doth lie, how shall my grieving life itself record? If I lose that sole good, my peace I cry, O then, sweet love, who only dost afford, to my mind solace here before I die. What shall I do if she is taken from me, to whom by thy great grace I gave myself all free? Henceforth, wherever I may dwell, I'll weep, and always dolorous stay so long as life. Within mine anguished body lodgeth deep, O soul so caitiff made by pain and strife, from that most wretched flesh alive to leap, should please thee well, O soul with sorrows rife. Escape my body, follow Chrysaes, O wherefore not escape such grievous woe as this, O sad mine eyes, whose solace dwelt entire, in the sweet face of winsome Chrysaes fair, how shall ye thrive henceforth, in grief most dire? year from now, since aunt dwells no longer there, and all your power must from hence expire, conquered and vanquished by my tears and care. In vain ye shall now other virtues view, if she, your health and safety, be thus torn from you. O Christ says mine, soul blessing fair and sweet, of this deep stricken soul that calls on thee, who will mine anguish now give comfort meet, who now bring peace to my love's agony. If thou depart, it fits that death come fleet, to this poor white who loves thee utterly. And I shall die a death all undeserved, because the scornful gods my fault have wrong observed. Alas, if yet thy parting were delayed, such time that through long use I bear it might, or yet prepare to feel it less dismayed, I would not say I should not with some right, oppose thy going hence by fate betrayed. Nay, had it been more clear before my sight, through longer thought, to part had easier been. To part, whence now it seems that all my woes begin. Evil-looking, ancient, doting seer, what ecstasy hath moved thee? What disdain hath made thee, Trojan, love the Greeks so dear? Thou must desert to them down on the plain. Above all prophets thou wert honored here. Native and stranger, thou filthy stain, of treason, evil reed, deceit, annoy. Oh, would I had thee at my mercy's will in Troy! Oh, would thou'dst died the day thou hadst escaped, hadst fallen dead before the Helen's feet, when first thy lips so madly gaped, demanding her who made to love so sweet! What heavy grief thy coming here hath shaped, O oh, loathed cause of all the woe I meet! Would that the spear that pierced Prostasilaus had been deep driven in thy heart by Menelaus! If thou wert dead, then should I live secure! for who would then my Chrysaes demand? And wert thou dead, I were not left for sure. For Chrysaes would not part from Troy's dear land. If thou wert dead, no griefs could then endure. Equal to these that now my joy withstand. Therefore thy life is of my death the cause, and of the curse that will not let my duller pause. A thousand sighs more burning hot than fire, thus issued from his deep love-smitten heart, mixed with laments and words of sad desire, without respect how each word played its part. And so these plaints availed through power dire. The youth could sigh no more by any art, and fell asleep, but yet he slept not long. For in a trice again he felt his grief grow strong. Another sigh, and to his feet he rose, went to the door which he had lately barred, opened it wide, and called a varlet close, a trusty white, and cried, stare not so hard. 
But stir thee, fellow, from thy soft repose. Bring Pandar here, let nothing him retard. Then straight he turned him to his grief-dark room, filled yet with sighs and clinging drowsiness and gloom. Pandaro came, already knowing well, that which the Greek envoys had asked full plain, and how the Trojan lords agreeing fell, to render Chrysaes to her sire again, whence in his face full great dismay did dwell, and there to Troil, pondering still his pain, entered the prince's dark and silent room, all impotent to speak a word of cheer or gloom. But Troil, when he saw his comrade well, ran and embraced the worthy Pendaro, yet wept so sore no poet ever could tell, the story of his tears, and then for woe. The anxious friend too into weeping fell, in that same wise, and both in moaning low, continued some time then to weep and mourn, saying no word so were their troubled hearts forlorn. At last when Troil found him calm again, to Pandar he began, Death's man am I, for all my joyance now is turned to pain. From wretched me my comfort all doth fly, at envious fortune's will, and in its train, my solace and my pleasance I disgray, hast not yet learned my cause for misery. That Chrysaes by the Greeks is torn away from me, and Pandar answered, who had wept, no less. Alack! I wish thy words were not so true, alack for me, whose faith would never confess. Thy joy so sweet and pure could change to rue, fail thee so soon, nor could I ever guess. That harm, save first it showed itself to view, could come and could despoil thee so complete. Now all my lore I see is turned into defeat. But yet, why give thyself such anguish now? Why feel thine is such grief and such torment? Thou'st had what thou hast willed, I trow. Thou oughtest then in heart feel more content. These and all other woes to me allow. To me who long have loved but never been sent, or shown one favor of the dame I woo. The lady who alone can give me peace for rue, and look thou too, old Troy is full enough, of ladies fair and gracious to the eye, and, as thy virtue never won rebuff, choose even the fairest and she'll make reply, no boon could seem to her of richer stuff, than devoir paid by thee with love and sigh. If therefore, being sage, thou Chrysaes forego, thou canst of many others gain great grace I know, and men in sooth I oft have heard declare, that new love always chases old away, some new amor will banish that despair. Thou feelest now, if thou do as I say. Wish not to die then for this lady fair, wish not to be thine own foe so today. Dost think through tears to have her back again, through tears, lest she should go, dost hope her to retain. And Troil, hearing Pandar, wept anew, and still more strong, protesting after brave. I pray God send at once the death that's due. If ever I commit excess so grave, let other damsels be as fair to view, and blithe as they may wish. None ever gave. To earth such beauty I confess as she, to whom I'm vowed and whose in all I wish to be. From her fair eyes have flown the subtle sparks, which have inflamed me with their amorous fire. A thousand times they've left in mine their marks, and gently borne with them sweet love's desire straight to my heart, to shine there in its darks, as Amor willed, and there Gan first inspire, that ardor whose great fervor still directs, my valor when it moves to its most true effects, however I might wish it, who wish it not, I could not check its potent warmth and glow, nay, if t'were greater I should grieve no jot, and more from only Chrysaeus I know, to part were grief and such a bitter lot, my love-flamed heart could not endure the blow, no other dame is there, and none I scorn. Who is her peer in aught, and none such ever was born? Then how could others' comfort ever aspire, or even love himself, that I should turn? To any other lady my desire, within I have to bear enough heartburn, but rather would I yield me to the fire, to woes yet more extreme than I should yearn, to put my mind on other ladies' eyes, or leave, O God of love, this world of joy and sighs. Death and the sepulchre alone can part. The firm, true love which now gives life to me, and whatsoever ill on me may start, they too, with it, may lead my soul, and see, down in the lowest hell, it suffer smart. For there they'll weep for Chrysaes verily, the lady whose I'll be wherever I dwell. If love doth not, through death, forget to bear all well.
Therefore, parties, cease thou, my Pandaro. Thy talk of other mistress for my heart, to enter therein where henceforth I know. I will keep Chrysase always with love's art, the sure seal of my joys, however woe. Now plague my mind, which labors in hard part, because she goes away of whom we speak, because we see no way to make the change we seek. Cease then to babble inadvisedly, for speech to make my pain less is but loss, and can be nothing more, we too shall see. For, Pandar, that is folly sheer and dross, too crude to cherish in the heart of thee. For every grief that moves our life across, doth pass whatever cursed fortune brings. And that man tells no truth who saith other things, but tell me if my love means aught to thee. If still thou think it is a thing so light, to change one's love as late thou spakest me, why thou'st not changed thy path as is thy right? Why let thy love cause thee such cruelty? Or, still severe, keep thee in such a plight? Why dost thou not thyself new dames pursue, that thou thy life with greater peace mayst hence imbue? If thou, inured to live in love's torment, hast not had power to seek new mistress fair, can I, who lived with love in glad content, hope so to drive him from me in my care? As thou dost urge, and prithee what is meant, that now I see quick grief to me repair. I am in love in very different wise, from that that in thy mind thou idly dost devise. In faith, Pandar, once love a mind doth seize, and enters there to be its joy supreme. Believe me thou, from there love never flees, nor can be driven, although sometimes I deem. In course of time love wanes by slow degrees, unless he sprang from poverty extreme or grief, or death, or absence from one's may. So have fared many men at haps before today. What shall I then, I, sad misfortuned wight, if I lose Chrysace in such a way? As I have lost her, why too, is it right? And tenor be exchanged for her, O oh say, alack. Death were more welcome in my sight, and never to have seen the light of day. More blessed, my heart despairs. Come death, draw near, O oh come lest I too long in love should languish here. O death, thou'lt be to me as soft and sweet, as life appears to him who lives in joy. Thy face, once horrid now as fair I'll greet, O hie thee here and finish mine annoy. O tarry not, for in my veins such heat is kindled now it must me soon destroy. Let thy harsh blow bring comforting to me, and haste thee to a heart that sore desireth thee. Slay me, for God's sweet sake do not consent that I so long in this dull world should thrive, and let me see my heart in glad content. Part from my corpse, O let it, death, arrive. I ask it thee, pardee, what more is meant, to give me joy than not to be alive? Thou slayest so much good at thine own will, to slay and pleasure me thou hast the power still. Thus wept in deep lament Prince Troilo, and Pandar likewise did, for very grief yet often sought to ease his friend's deep woe, and piteously he offered him relief. But comfort nothing helped the cruel blow, while still his weeping grew beyond belief, continually, and thereto, his lament. So much for his sad fate had swelled his discontent. And Pandar answered him, My dearest friend, if my appeals in nothing pleasure thee, and if to thee it seems too cruel end, to part from her, anon or presently. Why not accept the power gods do lend? Now to thy life and seize her instantly, to bear away as Paris stole from Greece. Helen, that flower of dames who wrecked the world's long peace, wilt thou in thine own Troy not venture even to carry off a dame that pleaseth thee? Thou wilt, if trusted all on me, thou lean. Chase off thy grief, chase and off, and so make flee. Thine anguish, and these woes too plainly seen, Dry up thy tears and let thy face be free. Let thy great spirit show itself once more. To make sweet Christ says ours, my prince, I do implore. And then to Pandar Troil made reply. I see, my friend, to drive away my pain. Thou wilt at nothing stop but all must try. Yet all thou urgest, with other things as plain. I've thought on much and raise before mine eye. The while I'd weep and yield to grief again to grief which somehow doth increase my power, keen though its shock hath been to make me pause and cower. But not therefore could I feel aught constrained. Good counsel, in love's fervor even, to scorn. Rather I thought and saw no wit was gained, 
the time forbade such error to be born, for, if a citizen could be regained, and Antenor at that I much should mourn, to break my oath and fealty unto Troy, hap then what might, I never could such means employ, besides I fear with rapine violent, much I should harm her honor and her fame, nor do I know she'd therewith be content, I only know she loves me, sans all blame, therefore my heart feels it in no way bent, to try such means as wish that her good name, be safe on one side, on the other, fear, to like unpleasant things they would not have appear, then had I weaned to ask by special grace, my father Priam should give her to me, then thought that were like accusation base, and making known things done in secrecy, I dared not hope he'd hearken to my case, and give her me through breaking utterly. The things he pledged, but knew he'd try to say, she was not of my rank, he'd find some royal may. So still I weep, and in love's maze remain, weary and unaware what I may do, because my might, whatever it may gain, through strength and love, I feel is failing too. On every side my hope flees off in pain, and causes of my grief grow ever new. I wish that I had died that luckless day, when I was first inflamed with passion in this way. And Pandar answered then, Do as thou please. But, were I now enamored as thou art, with show of truth I'd bid farewell to ease. And whatsoever guilt became my part, did I possess the power thou canst seize. Unless that power some strange force rose to thwart, I'd use it all and bear her safe away. Whoso might be displeased, or whoso might gainsay. Do not conceal thy love so subtilely, as now appears thou wouldst, when love's good still, heats the enamored soul incessantly, while love plagues yet with wild and hardy will, hath his own way, and then so forcibly, exposes thee to every torment ill, wish rather thou to be checked by restraint, than die with torture in thy sad and sore complaint, and thine is not the task a dame to steal, who would be distant from thy high intent but such a one as seeks no greater weal. And if for this great ill to thee were lent, or blame assigned, thou hast the power I feel, soon to succeed in it to thy content, or yet to give her back, and fate doth aid. Him who is brave, who makes the timid more afraid, and if this thing should bring her any grief, quite soon thou'lt have thy peace with her again, and that she'd suffer not, is my belief. So much thy love for her would ease her pain and for her fame she would soon feel relief, for that she lost, and little time complain. To speak thee sooth, the shame that Helen bore, this lady glad would bear could she thus please thee more. Pluck ardor then, be valorous once more, love holds no idle laws of faith or care, show of thy courage now its greatest store, and for thyself reward more rich prepare. I'll stand with thee each peril new before, as valiant as my power lets me dare. Deign but to act, my gracious friend, and lo, the gods will aid our cause with every well-struck blow. The prince, who each word understood full well, replied then to his friend, I am content. If in me now flames hotter yet did dwell, by twice a thousand times, if my torment were greater than it is, this must I tell. To satisfy it I'd never let my intent. Do any courteous dame one tiny ill, T'were better die than have her feel my selfish will. Then up, and let us stand no longer here. Bathe thou thy face, return we both to court. Beneath our laughter let no grief appear, the people nothing know of any sort. And we should bring them all to marveling near, by telling what both know, observe thy part. Keep thou my secret hid, I'll find a way, so that this very eve with Chrysaeus I may speak and stay. Meantime, dame rumor swift, who tells the true, and false with equal joy and eagerness. About all Troy with readiest wing she flew, and in words, careless freed from all duress, was whispering when and why and who, as Grecian envoys did old Troy address. How each did act, how Priam his oath swore, to give Greece Chrysaeus and have back Antenor. And this news soon the lady Chrysaeus heard, who for her father cared no more. And, O oh sad heart of mine, came first her word, within, while deep she gan her lot deplore, as well one might whose love was all transferred, to Troil, whom she loved all things before. And in her fear that what men said was true, she dared not ask one question in her care and rue, 
But as we often see when new things chance, one lady to another oft will go, if well disposed her pleasure to advance. So on the day that brought fair crises woe, full many came as twere to sing and dance, in pious joy with her for faring so. All gan explain what late occurred in Troy, the pact, her being soon exchanged, these ladies coy. While one began in sooth, I feel so glad, now thou canst to thy father to sojourn. A second would declare, it makes me sad, to see thee part with no thought to return, and still a third, through her can peace be had. Tween us in Greece, for Calchas you discern, as ye have heard, if we but with him treat, can make men as he wills take victory or defeat. This, and much other foolish female prate, she listless heard like one who was not there, sans answering, so mean she held its state. And yet her face was all too soft and fair, to hide those gentle thoughts of love and great, come in her heart with what she heard of care. In body she was present, but her mind, Rome's senseless otherwhere her Troilo to find, and these mistaken ladies who believed. They offered comfort, stood and chattered so.